Welcome back to the session, guys. Hope all of you are back after the break. So is everybody back? Please put a confirmation in the chat so that we can move forward. Is everybody back, guys? Yes or no? Is everybody back? Just put a confirmation in the chat. Yes. Okay, I received a message in the chat. Perfect. So let's move forward, guys. Okay, I've received a doubt from Shweta. Uh, will be solved uh, right now. Okay, so Shweta, if you remember, before the break, we saw the implement. Uh, we saw the theory of KNN machine learning model algorithm. Now it's time to see its implementation. So in the implementation, uh, that part will be clear to you. Fine. So let's cover the implementation now, guys. So what I will do is uh, as you know that in Azure, there are three tools that are available to you in order to create machine learning models. The first tool is Azure Notebook, where you have complete control. You have two more tools like Azure Auto ML and Azure ML Designer, in which you have lesser control. So as I meant, as I had mentioned earlier, that Azure Notebook is the tool that you uh, technical people should use, as we have more control over them. But the thing is in Azure ML uh, with Azure Notebook. Uh, yes, I'll be able to write code. I'll be able to have a lot more control. But the thing is, whatever code I execute, some amount of money will be deducted from my subscription. So to not have that, what I will do is I will try to open another notebook called Jupyter Notebook. This Jupyter Notebook is installed in my local laptop. It's not installed in Azure server. It's installed in my own laptop. So in Jupyter Notebook, if I write any code, no amount of money will be deducted. But remember the same code that I write in Jupyter Notebook, you can write the same code in Azure Notebook as well, and it will work in the same way. It's just that in Jupyter Notebook, the code that I write, no amount of money will be deducted. Whereas in Azure Notebook, some amount of money will be deducted. So to not have any money deducted, I'm choosing Jupyter Notebook. Right. So let me create a coding file over here. And this is where I will write the code to implement our first machine learning model algorithm called KNN. Before the lunch break, we already saw the theory of KNN. If you remember, Parag helped us to revise the theory of KNN. Now it's time to see the implementation. Okay. So remember, guys, that KNN is a supervised learning model, and within supervised, it is used for classification category. Now, any algorithm that is used for supervised learning model, okay, any uh, algorithm that is used for supervised learning model, uh, in order to implement algorithm, in order to implement that algorithm, we have nine steps, okay. So in order to implement any algorithm, in order to implement any algorithm used for supervised machine learning, supervised machine learning. There are a total of nine steps. The first step, the first step is to make sure that the data is clean. And when I say uh, the word clean, what do I uh, mean? So there are many things that comes under cleaning. So one of the things that comes under cleaning is to make sure that data should not have any missing values. Another thing that comes under cleaning is data should not have any spelling mistakes. Okay, it should not have any incorrect values and so on. Okay, but one of the major things that comes under cleaning is to make sure that data does not have any missing values. Okay, fine. Then second point to implement or the second step to implement is to make sure that we extract the features and targets separately. So you have to ensure that you extract the features and target separately. The third step, for implementing an algorithm under supervised machine learning is to make sure that our features are of numeric nature. If they are not of numeric nature, oops. Okay, sorry, I think I got disconnected in between. Uh, so my voice might have not been audible to you guys. Sorry about this issue. It's uh, because of my internet. It seems in the last few days, uh, Geo's internet is not working well. But anyways, moving forward. So just to recap, I you might have missed 
what I was saying due to that internet connection issue. So just to revise. Uh, so what I said was before the lunch break, we saw how to implement our first machine learning model algorithm called KNN. Now it's time to see its implementation. So in order to implement any algorithm that is used for supervised machine learning, if you remember KNN is also used for supervised machine learning. So any algorithm that is used to used for supervised machine learning, in order to implement that algorithm, there are a total of nine steps out of which three steps I have already written. First step is to make sure that data should be clean. There are many things that you need to check for a clean data. First thing is you need to check that data should not have many missing values. Second thing you need to check that data should not have any spelling mistakes. There are no incorrect values and so on. But the major thing that you will see under cleaning the data is to ensure that data does not have any missing values. Second step that you will perform is to extract the features and targets separately. Third step is to make sure that features are of numeric nature. Fourth step is to make sure that uh, features are of the type array or data frame. Okay, since I'm implementing it in Python, the features should be of a type array or data frame. Array and data frame are two different Python data structures. Okay, so your features should be one of these types. Uh, it should either be in the form of an array or it should either be in the form of a data frame. The fifth step for implementing the algorithm uh, is to make sure that features should have some rows and some columns. Okay, this might seem like a very basic step. You might feel that even if you skip this step is fine, but I will show you a scenario where this step is not being followed or I should say this rule is not being followed. And what will be the issue of that? I will show that to you. Okay, so it's important. It looks very basic, but it's not. It's a very important step. Do not skip it. Do not skip any of these steps that I'm going to write down. Fine. So out of nine steps, I've already written five. Now it's time to move on to my sixth step. So sixth step is to make sure that we split the data into two parts, training and testing. Training and testing. Okay, fine. After doing that, what I will do is I'll move on to my seventh step, which is to make sure that the features are on the same scale. Now, what do I mean by the term scale, same scale? I will explain that to you in detail, so don't worry about it. The eighth step then is to train the model on the training data set. Train the model on the training data set. And then the ninth and last step is to test the model on the testing data set. Test the model on the testing data set. Okay, so coming to uh, one doubt that one student had mentioned earlier. So I guess it was mentioned by Swit Shweta. So let me address that doubt. And there is another doubt that Saravanan has mentioned. Uh, Saravanan, uh, duplicates are fine unless it is an incorrect value. Okay, see in the data, you will have lots of rows. You have crores of rows. It's fine if a value is being uh, uh, rewritten again. What I mean to say is there should not be incorrect information in the data. Okay, so for example, in the first row, uh, if you have a feature value of 10, in the third row, also if you have a feature value of 10, that's okay. Okay, as long as it's a correct value that you have written. Right. So when I say data should be clean, one of the things that you need that you need to do is to ensure that data should not have any missing values. Second thing that you need to do is that it should not have any incorrect values and so on. Okay, fine. Uh, we'll, when we'll implement this, it will make more sense. Okay, coming to Shweta's doubt. Okay, so Shweta, uh, let's try to understand. So you wanted to check, uh, I guess to read your doubt again, you wanted to check uh, how do we calculate the performance of the model, right? So let's go ahead and let's see it. So you use the term accuracy. So how do we calculate that? Let's see. So Shweta, what we do generally is, let's suppose we have some data with us. Okay, in that data, suppose I have some rows and columns with me. Uh, let me assume some information over here. Let's suppose I have a age column, experience column, and gender column. And let's suppose 
I have six rows within it. OK. So let me put in some values. I'll just go ahead, put in some values over here. Let me put in some values. OK. And once I'm done with putting the values, I'll show you what to do next. OK, now let's go ahead. Now what we generally do over here, Shweta, is from my overall data, I put some rows and uh, put it into a separate data set called training data set. Whereas the remaining rows I put it into testing data set. OK, now it depends upon you as a machine learning engineer. How many percentage of the rows you want in training data set? How many percentage you want in testing data set? So let's suppose here, Shweta, just for simpler understanding, we are splitting it in a 50-50 manner. That 50% of the rows will go into training, let's assume. And 15% of and 50, 50% 50, of the rows will go into testing. OK. So Shweta, here I have a total of six rows. So if I say 50% into training data set, 50% into testing data set. So what will happen is out of a total of six rows, three rows might go into training and three rows go into testing. Let's say just for the sake of the example that I want the first three rows go to go into training and then the last two rows to go into testing data set. Okay. Remember, Shweta, that we only train the model on which data set, Shweta? We train the model on which data set? Training data set or testing data set? What do you think? If I ask your question, Shweta. We train the model on which data set? Training data set or testing data set? Training data set, right? We train the model on training data set. Let's say my training is done on the training data set. Now the time for testing has come. So what the model does is, okay, what the model does is, during testing, it passes the feature values to the model and tells the model that, okay, model, you have trained yourself now. Now tell me, looking at these feature values, what are your prediction? So the model might give a prediction. OK, the model might give a prediction for the first row. It might predict a target value of female for the next row. It might predict a target value of female for the another row. It might predict a target value of male and so on. OK, so let's say it has done this prediction. So on the left hand side, Shweta, we have the original target values on the right hand side. We have the predicted target values. So let's cal calculate the accuracy, Shweta. So uh, what is the formula of accuracy? The formula of accuracy is number of correct predictions divided by total number of predictions number of correct predictions divided by total number of predictions total number of predictions so shweta can you tell me that uh, total how many predictions did you make over here uh, or i should say total the model has made how many predictions Three, perfect. So the denominator will be three. Out of three, how many predictions were correct? For, for the first row, it was correct. For the second row in testing data set, it was correct. For the third, it was not correct. So two, right? So out of three, two predictions were correct. So accuracy will be two out of three, which is equal to 0 0.67. Or in percentage terms, if I want to convert, this will be around 67% accurate. So question was, how do we calculate accuracy? Well, this is how we calculate. This is the theory that I have explained to you. I will also show you its implementation so that it is more clear. But Shweta, is the theory of uh, your doubt clear now? You had asked some doubt earlier. Is the theory of that clear? If not, let me know. Yes, clear? Okay. Fine. So let's go ahead. All right, so let's dive into the implementation now. So before we implement any algorithm, any machine learning algorithm, we need some data. So let's go ahead and let's get that data over here. I have my data in the form of a CSV file. So inside that CSV file, I have some data. Let me go ahead and let me read the data from the CSV file. I'll just go ahead. 
read the data from the CSV file over here. And let's see what data do we have inside of that CSV file. Let's check. I will read it in such a way that I convert that data to a tabular format. And let me show you that data in tabular format over here. Here it is. So guys, here I have data of iris flowers. So what scientists did was they tried to record information about some iris flowers in the forest. Okay, uh, so they recorded information about a total of 150 iris flowers. 150 iris flowers. For each iris flower, that they, uh, they have recorded information in one row. So in the first row, they have recorded information about the first iris flower. In second row, they have recorded information about second iris flower and so on. So like that, they have recorded information about 150 iris flowers across 150 rows. Okay. And uh, what they have done is they have recorded a lot of information. So first they have recorded the species of the iris flower. Now there are only three species of iris flower. Either the species will be, uh, either the species over here will be iris setosa. Let me write it down. Iris setosa. Or the species will be iris versicolor. Or these species will be Iris virginica. These are the only three species of Iris flower available in the world. Okay. These are the only three species of Iris flowers available in the world. Fine, sir. They have recorded the information about the species of the Iris flower. Okay. After that, uh, they have recorded information about the petal width of that Iris flower. Then they have recorded information about the petal length of that Iris flower. Then they have recorded information about sepal width of that iris flower. Then they have recorded information about sepal length of that iris flower. And they have also given a, a, a ID to that iris flower. So if it was the first iris flower that they encountered in the forest, they gave it an ID of one. If it was the second iris flower that they encountered, they gave it an ID of two and so on. Fine. All right. So here we have data about iris flowers. On this data, we are going to do our work. So fine. Let's do the work. First step is to make sure that data is clean. Uh, and one of the major things that we'll uh, look over here is to make sure that data should not have any missing values. So let's check if the data has any missing values or not. On checking, we observe that data has no missing values whatsoever. The ID column has zero missing values. Sepal length column has zero missing values. Sepal width column has zero missing values. Similarly, the remaining columns also have zero missing values. So we do not have any missing values whatsoever. OK, uh, there are other things that you would do in data cleaning. Uh, for example, you will check whether there are incorrect values or not and so on and so forth. However, here due to lack of time, I won't do that. Even if you do it uh, over here, I know that this data is correct. OK, I've done all of that validation. Uh, this data is correct. There is no spelling mistake, nothing like that. Here, I am not doing it uh, currently because there are 150 rows. OK. I'm not doing that currently over here. Anyways, uh, due to lack of time, I'm not checking for spelling mistakes. But even if I check, I won't find any. So that's good. OK, now second step is to make sure that uh, we extract the features and targets separately. So let's do that. So here, guys, my target column is this column called species. OK, remember there are three species of iris flowers. Either these species will be iris setosa, or the species will be iris versicolor, or the species will be iris virginica. These are, the, these are the only three species of iris flower. So that means if this is your target column, if species is your target column, and if in your target column you have finite set of possibilities, then you will be building a classification model. And we know that KNN algorithm can, use, be, can be used for classification purposes. So fine, let's implement KNN now. We'll be doing that, but before that, we need to implement these steps. So first step I've already implemented. Second step is to extract the features and targets separately. OK, so over your uh, my target is this column called species. So I will extract it separately. Then my uh, feature columns, what will be my feature columns? So currently all the columns apart from species will be my potential feature columns. OK, all the columns apart from species will be my potential feature columns. So let's have a look into our potential feature columns. 
and uh, you let me know is there any column that you feel is not that is not worthy to become a feature if there is such a column that is not worthy to become a feature we'll drop it remember feature column is that column that helps me to predict the target my target is species so is there any column that does not help me to predict species let's see petal which do you think it could help me to predict species yes well certain species of flower might have a certain petal length right they might have a big petal length some species might have a small petal length and so on so yes a petal uh, sorry petal width uh, i should say some species could have a small petal width some could have a, a big petal width and so on so i think a petal width could affect uh, could help me to predict species similarly petal length could help me to predict species sepal width could help me to predict species sepal length also could help me to predict species okay uh, what about id column guys what about id column do you think does it help me to predict these species guys what do you think does it help me to predict these species id anyone in the chat no right ashweta mentions id is, is not a good column over here i don't think it will help me to predict species so that's why that particular column i will go ahead and drop i don't think it is worthy to become a uh, feature column so i will go ahead and i will drop that column now i have one more doubt uh, that one student has mentioned in the chat let me address that doubt over here okay so the student has said can you share the lab exercise link okay so uh, this implementation that we are doing is not in the official labs of ai102 okay uh, currently i'm just explaining you the basics okay so you won't find the lab link as such what i can do is i can share uh, the uh, data set with you okay you can write the code side by side with me or i'll do one thing uh, once i once i'm done with the coding file once i'm fully done with the implementation i will share the entire coding file with you as well okay but uh, since this is just the basics of machine learning we will learn uh, you won't find uh, its link anywhere in the official labs of dp100 okay but fine uh, you will get asked questions based on this because of which i am explaining this to you okay uh, in the online labs you might uh, find a implementation with a different data set maybe okay uh, here i am explaining with a different data set okay because i want to explain some of the theoretical stuff okay fine so i'll do one thing just so that you have this implementation file with you at the end i will show you this implementation file i will share the coding file okay raghu says it looks same as google colab yes jupyter notebook is almost the same as google colab okay it's just that google for google colab you don't have to download right uh, whereas for uh, jupyter notebook uh, you need to download jupyter notebook in your laptop okay so saravanan is your doubt clear buddy or some other doubt you wanted to ask then let me know clear saravanan okay. there is some other doubt you can let me know guys fine uh, let's move forward so over here what we are doing is we were into our second step okay now let's move forward and uh, currently i have a issue with this step let's try to understand what that issue is so what have i done uh, any mistake in my code as such let's try to understand and uh, the mistake is there a mistake over here i don't think there is a spelling mistake as such mm, mistake that i have done in my code what other mistake could i be doing let me check the error id not found why have i already removed it or have i written the code uh, multiple times okay yes i uh, ran the code multiple times because of which there was a issue i'll do one thing i'll run the code from start so that we don't have any issue whatsoever fine is that okay now you can see i don't have any uh, error in my code whatsoever okay with this i'm done with my uh second step over here now let me move on to my third step third step is to make sure that features are of numeric nature so let me go ahead and check if features are of numeric nature or not you can check the values in the feature columns all of them are of numeric nature 
Okay, all of them are of numeric nature. You can see the type. So in sepal length column, all the data values are of the type float. Float is one of the numeric data types. Similarly, in the remaining columns also, all the values are of numeric data types. Okay, so fine. Our third step is done. If suppose if any feature value, feature column, I should say, if any feature column did not have numeric values, then we would convert it to numeric values. Today, I will show you one other example where uh, in a different data set, this rule will not satisfy. So in that scenario, what to do? Uh, how would you convert a feature column that does not contain numeric values to numeric values? I will explain that to you, so don't worry. Fine, third step done. Now, moving on to my fourth step. Fourth step is to make sure that features are of uh, the type array or data frame. So let's go ahead and check if they are of the type array or data frame. And you will observe that my features are of the type data frame. So no need to worry. Then fifth step is to make sure that features should have some rows and columns. So let's go ahead and check if features have some rows and some columns or not. On checking, we observe that my features have 150 rows and four columns. So that's good. They do have some rows and some columns. That's absolutely good over here. Now we are done with the fifth step. Let's move on to step number six. Step number six is to split the data into two parts, training and testing. So let's do that. Let's split our data into two parts, training and testing. In order to do it, what will I do? I will import a function. So from sklearn folder, there is a file called model selection. Inside that file, we have a function called train test split. And this is the function that I'll be using in order to perform my step number six. Step number six is to split the data into two parts, training and testing. And for that, I'll be using this particular function over here, the one that I just imported. Fine, let's use it. The first thing that I will pass instead of the function is my features, which are referenced by a variable x. Then the second thing that I will pass is my target, which is referenced by a variable y. Okay. After that, I will mention details about my splitting. So what is the percentage of the data that I want in testing data set? What is the percentage of data that I want in training data set? So let's say I want 20% of the data in testing, remaining 80% I want in training. So over here to test size, I have passed a value of 0 0.2. 0 0.2 suggests that 20% of the overall data you want to go into testing and remaining 80% you want it to go into training. Okay, now I have a question for you. Let me ask that question to you guys. Okay, now uh, suppose I have some data with me. Okay, and in that data I have a total of uh, five rows in that data. I have a total of five rows. Let me assume that we have a data of five rows. OK, now uh, let me uh, ask this question to you. So suppose what we want to do is let's suppose I want to have 60% of the rows in training and 40% of the rows in testing. So in total over here, currently I have five rows. 60% of five is three. So that means three rows will go into training and two rows will go into testing. Now the question to each and every one of you is, I want three rows in training, okay? So is it like I will always get the first three rows in training or the last three rows in training or the three rows in training data set are selected at random? What do you think happens? I want three rows in training. How do I get those rows? Do I get the starting three rows in training, the ending three rows in training, or do I get the three rows randomly? So Pragna and Manoj are absolutely right. I get the three rows randomly. Perfect. So one answer you have correctly answered. Sorry, one question you have correctly answered. Okay. Now I want. Uh, uh, I will ask you a second question. Okay. So uh, Pranav, tell me this one thing, buddy. Uh, let's say I'm uh, giving the model rows into the training data set. Remember, Pranav, that these rows will be called as examples. So if I'm giving three rows into the training data set, they will be treated as three examples. Each row to the model acts as an example. The more examples you give, 
in the training data set, the better it will be for your model. Just like Pranav, if I'm training you, the more examples I give, the better it will be for your performance. Similarly to the model also, the more examples you give in the training data set, the more rows you give in the training data set, the more better it will be for the model. Okay. Now, uh, so Pranav, one thing to remember is the quantity of the rows in the training data set. You should have as many rows as possible. Okay. The second is quality as well. So Pranav, apart from quantity, can I say quality of examples also matters? So for example, Pranav, if I give good examples to you, you will understand it well. However, if I give bad examples to you, your performance will not be good. Right? So apart from quantity of examples, quality also matters. Right? So that also matters. Okay. Fine. Uh, now, uh, let's go ahead. Okay. So suppose, guys, uh, in my data, I have a total of five rows. Okay. Out of those five rows, or I should I should say out of those five examples, uh, first three examples are good. The remaining two examples are bad. Okay. Uh, by bad examples, let's say there are there are uh, there is some uh, you can say outliers, uh, outlier values. Okay. Outlier values means odd man out values, a value that is very different from the rest of your data. Okay, and such outlier values uh, do affect your uh, model performance. How do how does it affect? So let's understand first how does outlier affect model performance. Then we'll come again back to this example that I was looking with Pranav. First, let me explain to you how outlier values affect model performance. Affect the model performance. Okay, so Pranav, I will need your help, buddy. So what I will do is I will uh, enable mic for you and uh, let me do this. I will need your help. So one second, let me enable your mic. And I will need your help. Okay, so let me click on this button for allow mic. Yeah, I so I guess. Huh. Yeah. So Pranav, uh, now first we'll try to understand how outlier values affect performance. Let's understand. So let's assume Pranav that you are the principal of a school. Okay. And uh, we have first standard students in your school. Let's assume first standard students or first grade students. In some states, you call it first grade. In some states of India, you call it first standard. Okay. So let's suppose we have first standard students over here. Okay. And uh, what you want to do is you as a principal are uh, uh, responsible for uh, creating benches for those students. Okay. So uh, you as a principal, can I say Prana, what you will do is uh, you will find out what should be the height of the bench for first standard students and pass on that, pass on that information to the furniture company. Correct? Yes. Okay. Now Prana, let's assume you have some uh, people in your first standard. Okay. And let's say uh, one student has a normal height in first standard. He has a height of 2.2 feet. Okay. Another student has a height of 2.3 feet. Okay. But now you have some uh, outlier values. Let's say in first standard, you have one student whose height is 7 feet. You have another student whose height is 7.1 feet and so on. Okay. So you tell me first, Pranav. That can I say these last two students' heights are odd man outs or yeah. outliers? Yes. Okay. Now, how will it affect uh, the thinking? Let's understand. So, Pranav, let's say you are the principal. You are going to be the one who will find out the correct height for first standard students. So, can I say first what you will do is you will calculate the height of all your first standard students and find out their average height, correct? Yes. Okay, so here the average height of them is what? Uh, if I use the calculator and find out their average height, let's see. The average will be somewhere close to four. Okay, so it's 4.65. So you will say, tell the furniture company guy that create a bench assuming that the average height of the student is 4.65. Correct, Pranav? Yes. Now, but it is because so of that, mm -hmm. uh, because of that, 
can i say yes the last two students will still be able to work on that bench right right yes so, uh, yes but these first two students will not be able to work because i mean you are asking the furniture guy to create a bench assuming that the average height of student is 4.65 feet so what about these small small height students it will the, this bench will be too big for them so they will not be able to work so you are understanding pranav that just because of presence of outliers how our entire uh, output is changing in a negative way correct correct fine however if we didn't have outliers then you would have just proceeded now normally if you didn't have outliers at all okay let's say you had normal values only then you would have just proceeded normally as it is you would have calculated the average height of uh, students over here whatever is the average height and you will make the bench accordingly uh, uh, you will give that order accordingly to that furniture guy fine so remember that presence of outliers affects the entire uh, uh, output okay so if a row has outliers it will be called a bad row or a bad example so let's assume pranav out of five rows three rows are good two rows are bad that means three examples are good two examples are bad now uh, i want to do splitting on this overall data so let's say i want three rows in training two rows in testing so pranav uh, how are the three rows in training selected are the first three rows in training selected are the last three i mean are the last three rows of the data selected in training the first it's three random. rows of data random okay so correctly said it was selected at random but even in random selection pranav is there a possibility that still the first three rows get selected in training yeah it's random so possibility correct. is there Poss correct so let's suppose that happens let's suppose that happens okay so now the you are training on three rows and i have highlighted these three rows in green color to suggest to you that these are good rows so pranav if i give you good examples while training you can i say your performance will be high yes so similarly if i give good examples to the model for training the model's performance will be high so let's say you give good examples while training the model and the model's performance is very high so the model's performance is somewhere uh, let's say uh, 100% your model was 100% accurate let's assume okay so you are very happy so you call your boss pranav okay and you tell your boss that oh boss i have made this very brilliant model it's giving me 100% accuracy so your boss will be happy he will say okay okay pranav come to the office the next day and show me the working of the model in front of me okay so you go to the office the next day but now pranav next day when you go to the office next day when you go to the office and you run the code of data splitting in front of your boss can i say tomorrow when you will go to the office when you will do data splitting again random three rows will be selected so is it possible that now tomorrow different three rows are selected in training possible or not possible so let's suppose these rows are selected in training last three rows are selected in training let's assume okay then now uh in the rows that you have selected in training are there some bad rows also are there some bad examples also yes a as oh. indicated by this red color yes we have some bad yes. examples because of that the model's performance will reduce drastically so now your performance will drop let's say it drop it is now 33% so from 100% it dropped to 33 so your border uh, your boss will be very very mad with you he will say are you fooling me or what yesterday you told me or you are getting 100% accuracy now your model is giving me 33% what are you doing are you fooling me or what the thing is you are not fooling your boss okay why this sudden change in accuracy came what was the reason behind it prano outliers row 4 and 5 okay or can i say this uh, this could have been prevented if yes let's say yesterday and today i had same rows selected in training yes i could have prevented this if yesterday and today i have same rows selected in training how to do that we do that using a concept called seed okay so although some random selection is happening but what i can do is i can pass on a seed value 
and any seed value I can pass, any real number I can pass. The thing is, if I pass this seed value of 10 today, and if I pass this seed value 100 years later, then today and 100 years later, I will get the same set of rows in training and testing. Okay, so what we are doing, we are passing a seed value. You can pass any seed value, but whichever seed value you pass today, you need to pass the same seed value, let's say 100 years later as well, so that today and 100 years later, you will get the same set of rows in training and testing. Okay, this seed value is very common in Python. Just to show you an example over here. Okay, so remember that uh, seed is an initial value. Okay, seed is a initial value. It is an initial value fed into the random generate uh, into the random number generation algorithm, random number generation algorithm, also known as RNG algorithm. Okay, also known as RNG algorithm to start a sequence of pseudo random numbers. Okay, pseudo random means it's not totally random. We can control the randomness of it. Okay, for example, if I pass in a seed value, I can uh, do one. Okay, so fine. Uh, so to have uh, this randomness generated, I can go ahead and pass a seed value. Okay. Uh, so what does the seed act? It acts as a starting value at our it acts as a starting point for the sequence. Seed acts as a starting point for the sequence. Starting point for the sequence. OK, so fine. Uh, so over here, let me go ahead and let me explain it to you with the help of an example. OK, let me explain it to you with the help of an example. Let's see whether I have this random uh, library import working as yes, it works. So now what I will do is suppose I'm setting a seed value. Of 42. OK, uh, so let me go ahead and let me print three random numbers. I'll go ahead and I'll print three random numbers over here. Let me do that. So this is the first one. OK, currently I have a, a error. Yes, let's correct some syntax issue and this is the first one. Uh, this is the second one. OK, this is the third one. Now let me pass the same seed value again. So what will happen again? The starting point will be from this particular value only and have a look. If I go ahead and generate random numbers again, have a look. So previously, the first number that was generated was 0 0.63. Now also it is 0 0.63. Previously, the second number that was generated was 0 0.02. Now also it is 0 0.02. Previously, the third number that was generated was 0 0.27. Now also it is also 0.27. Okay. So with this seed, we can make sure that every time when we run the code, we get same sequence of pseudo random numbers. Coming to our machine learning problem, we wanted the same sequence of rows in training and testing every time. So for that, you can pass a seed value over here if you want. Okay. So let's say I'm passing a seed value of 10 today and I'm passing a seed value of 10 100 years later. Then today and 100 years later, I will get same set of rows and training and test. And remember to this seed value, you can pass any real number, any real number will work. But whatever seed value you pass today, you have to pass the same seed value later on as well. So that today and later on, you get same rows in training and testing. Okay, remember this. Fine. Now, there is one more problem that will arise in train test split. Let's understand that problem first. Once we understand the problem, we will figure out the solution to that problem. So let's understand the problem that can arise in train test split. Okay, and based on this, a question is asked in the exam and your DP 100 exam. Fine, let me show you the problem. So suppose I have a target column. Okay, and what I'm doing over here, guys, is let's say every day uh, I'm trying to search for Mars planet through my telescope. OK, let's suppose I have a telescope at, at my home and through that telescope every day I'm trying to search for a mass planet. Uh, so if I find the mass planet on that day, then I will mention that I have found a mass planet. If I have not found the mass planet, then I will mention that OK, on that day I have not found the mass planet and so on. So let's say I have some data like that. OK, 
in that data let's suppose what happened was on the first day uh, i did not find a mars planet on the second day i did not find a mars planet on the third day i did not find on the fourth day i did not find on the fifth day though i did find a mars planet on the sixth day i did find a mars planet on the seventh day i did find a mars planet on the eighth day i did find a mars planet fine now let's move forward let's suppose some of the rows i want in training and some of the rows i want in testing so let's suppose four rows i want in training and the remaining four rows i want in testing okay now let's see a problem that could arise now pranav as you mentioned earlier as well but just to ask that question again to you i want four rows in training four rows in test fine so four rows in training first are these four rows uh, selected at random or is it like first four rows will go into training or last four rows will go into training how are the four rows selected in training random random but even in random selection as you had mentioned earlier there is a possibility that even in random selection let's say the first four rows go into training there is a possibility like that okay now another question for you pranav pranav can i say you only know those things on which you are trained you might be trained on those things in your school you might be trained on those things in your college or internet or real world okay but you only know those things on which you are trained yes or no yes yes so, for example me also i only know those things on which i am trained only because someone told me that okay this round thing in the night sky that you see is called a moon only then i came to know that okay this is called a moon otherwise how would i know whether it's a moon or not okay so we only know those things on which we are trained similarly the model will also know only those things on which the model is trained other things it won't know okay so pranav my model is trained on how many examples currently only one not mars Uh, no no in hmm. total how many rows four four okay so four examples perfect now pranav as you mentioned in any of the examples have i mentioned even one example of mars no no all the examples are of not mars only i have not even mentioned one example of mars because of which the model won't know that such a target value even exists i am not passing even one example of mars so how will my model know that such a target value of mars exists it won't know if it does not know that such a target value called mars exists pranav will it ever be able to predict such a target value called mars never no if it does not know that such a target value called mars exists how will it predict it it will never ever predict it this is a big problem agreed pranav this is a big problem yes yes true okay how to solve this problem let's see how to solve this problem for that guys we will use a statistical technique sorry i remove that code by mistake okay no issues i'll introduce that code again i'll introduce that code again over here by mistake i removed it and uh, coming to the solution to that problem so where pranav uh, has uh, found out uh, the problem that the problem is it could happen that we were not we are not passing even a single example of other target values in the training data set okay so in that scenario what to do in that scenario what you can do is you can use this technique called stratification the idea behind stratification is that the proportion proportion of target values that are present in the original target column the same values should be present in training and testing data sets as well okay so what it says is let's say uh, in the overall target column the value not mars has occurred 60% of times and the value mars has occurred 40% of times then in training data set also it should occur 60 40 ratio in testing data set also it should occur in 60 40 ratio like that so let's understand so pranav in my original target column 
the value mars and not mars are occurring in which proportion is 1 is to 0 not mars okay. yeah. or no no in my overall target column overall so it's 50 ah. 50 50 50 perfect so over here the value not mars and mars is occurring 50 50 percent of the times not mars is occurring 50 percent mars is occurring 50 50 percent so the theory of stratification says that do the splitting in such a manner that this ratio exists in training data set also and this ratio exists in testing data set also let's see how will we do it so let's have some four rows in training four rows in testing first so apart from maintaining the splitting ratio will also maintain the stratification ratio. Let's see how. First, let's try to maintain the splitting ratio. Okay, so what could happen is we could have, let's say, these rows in training data set. These rows in training data set. Okay. Because we know the rows in training data set are selected at random. Uh, the remaining rows could be in the testing data set. The remaining rows could be in testing data set. Okay, once that is done, I will show you what to do next. Now have a look, Pranav. Do we have four rows in training, four rows in testing? First, tell me that. Yes. Yes, we do have. So fine. Now, stratification ratio stated that same proportion that was same proportion of target values that was uh, uh, in present in the original target column same proportion should be there in training and testing data sets as well so in the original target column the value mars and not mars were occurring 50 50 percent of the times let's see now in the training data set let's see in the training data set we have this value first i'll just mention the rows in training data set these are the rows in training data set, the one that I have selected in green. Have a look into the rows of training data set, uh, Pranav. The value not Mars and Mars in training data set, is it occurring 50-50% of times? Yes, it's occurring. Yes. And even in testing data set, you can check. Even in testing data set over here, you can check. Here are the rows of my testing data set, the one that I have drawn in blue. And even in testing data set, the, the values not Mars and Mars are occurring 50 50 percent of times. Yes. Okay. Uh, because of that, stratification uh, ratio is solved. And because of that, let's see whether our issue previously that we had is solved or not. Previously, our issue was that in the training data set, there was not even one example where the planet was a Mars planet, because of which the model does not even know that such a target value called Mars exists. If it didn't even know that such a target value called Mars exists, how will it predict it? Now, Pranav, are we in the training data set, are we passing enough example of both the target values? Yes, yes. Yes. So now the model will be able to uh, know that, okay, we have these target, such target values with us. So it will be able to predict those. Okay. So over here, we have solved the issue that we had previously with help of stratification. Pranav, one last question for you. This theory of stratification is applied on which type of column? Target. Target. Correct. And OK, so I will apply stratification on my target column. You tell me, Pranav, my target column is referenced by which variable? Uh, the last species. I mean, Y. Y. Perfect. So over here, I will just say stratify equal to Y. That's it. OK, that completes my code for six step. And what I will do, it will split uh, the data into training and testing. First, my features will be split. My features are referenced by a variable X. So it will split it into two parts, X train and X test. Then my target, which is referenced by variable Y, will be split into two parts. So I'll get Y train and Y test. With this, one second, I have some uh, spelling issues in my code. I'll correct it and you can see my code works. Okay, moving on to my step number seven. Step number seven is to make sure that features are on the same scale. So let's go ahead and check if the features are on the same scale or not. OK, what do I mean by the term same scale? Let's understand. OK, so suppose guys. Uh, we had. Uh, features. OK. That have different different ranges. 
Okay, let me show you an example. We have features having different ranges. Okay, let's suppose uh, I have some data with me. In that data, I have area of the house in square feet. I have information about the number of bedrooms in the house. Let's have information about my target column, which is price. Okay, let's suppose I have some data with me over here. Uh, now I'll just go ahead and mention some random values. I'll just mention some random values over here and then I'll show you what to do next. Okay, and let me show to you what to do next. Okay, fine. So suppose over here, uh, the last column is my target column. And the remaining columns are my feature columns. Now have a look into your two feature columns, Pranav. I will need your help. Sorry to bother you again, but I'll need your help one more time. Have a look into your two feature columns over here, Pranav. Uh, are the two feature columns of a different range? Mm, yes. Yes. My size for feature column will typically range from, let's say, 100 square feet to 5,000 square feet, right? Whereas number mm. of bedrooms can range from 1 to 5. So yes. because of this, what will happen is the feature column having a higher range will always dominate a feature column having lower range. Okay, well, how? Let me show that to you. How? Let me show that. So let's say I am going ahead and uh, uh, you know doing my uh, KNN task. In KNN, uh, do you remember we find out the distance between two points? Yes. Right. Okay. So let's suppose I am finding out the distance. Uh, let's suppose with respect to my unlabeled data point, I am finding out the distance. Let's suppose. So. Here, I have an unlabeled data point. Put something like this. Okay, there's unlabeled now, so I won't have the label for it. I won't have the target value for it. Okay, so with respect to that, let me calculate distance of the other label data points. Okay. Fine. So let me calculate distance of the unlabeled data point with respect to this point. Okay, so I'll calculate distance. Let's suppose I'm doing with the Euclidean formula. So with Euclidean formula, I will, it will be x2 minus x1, the whole square plus y2 minus y1, the whole square. So this should be 100 square plus zero square. 100 square is what? 100 square is uh, 10,000, I believe. If I'm not wrong, 100 square is 10,000. Yes. And root square root of 10,000 is 100 only. Okay. So the distance between my unlabeled data point and the first labeled data point is equal to 100. Agreed, Pranav? Yes. Okay, so over here I found out the distance, it is equal to 100. Okay, now, okay, now suppose guys, now let's suppose in a feature column, as I mentioned, if a feature column has a higher range as compared to its fellow other feature columns, the feature column having higher range will always dominate the calculation. Okay, it will always dominate the calculation. And let me show that to you. Okay, so let's suppose original distance was equal to 100. I'll mention it over here. That original distance that I found out was equal to 100. Original distance was equal to 100. Now, let me do some slight change. What I will do is, uh, let's suppose I have a slight change in the feature value. Okay. Uh, instead of 200, uh, 2000, let me reduce it by, uh, let me reduce it by a factor of 10%. So 2000 minus 10% will be what? 1800. 
right if i am not wrong 1800 correct right. no okay yeah. so just to show to you that why am i saying that a fe feature column having large range values will dominate a feature column having low range values let's see okay let's see uh, now uh, let me show you this uh, let me calculate the distance again so this will be square root of x2 minus x1 the whole square plus y2 minus y1 the whole square okay and uh, instead of uh, reducing this by 10% why don't i reduce it by 20% let's do that that will be more better or 20 or let me reduce by 30% okay just so that i am uh, arriving at a, a example that is more understandable to you okay fine i have reduced it by 30% so this will be or my euclidean distance formula will be x2 minus x1 the whole square plus y2 minus y1 the whole square okay so there should be 500 square okay plus 0 square uh, 500 square plus 0 square and the entire thing i'll put it on square root so this will be equal to 500 okay so now have a look uh, so have a look over here prano if i do a change in my uh, feature column that has a higher range okay if i do a change in my feature column that has a higher range what is the distance coming out to be 500 okay so let me write it down that if i do a change in a feature column having higher range okay having higher range in that case this is the distance that is coming out to be. okay fine what change did i make from 2000 i reduced it to 1400 that means i uh, reduced uh, the feature value to minus 30% agreed pranav yes okay now let me do this one thing pranav over here i will do a change i will do a change right now but now instead of doing a change in the feature column that has a higher range let me do a change in the feature column that has a lower range something like this so five value if i reduce it by 30% what will i get Mm, 3.5 3.5 okay let me write down 3.5 over here okay and have a look let's calculate the distance again okay so this will be 2000 minus 1900 the whole square plus 3.5 minus 5 the whole square so this should be 100 square plus 1.5 square 1.5 square comes out to be what 1.5 square let me use calculator for the same so 1.5 square okay so 100 square is 1000 plus 2.25 sorry 100 square is 10000 plus 2.25 is this i will take the square root of it okay so it comes to around 100.01 100.01 100.01 okay so now have a look over here can i say i did the same percentage change in a feature value having lower range over here pranav can i say that mm. yes same percentage change na 30% 30% okay so previously when i did it on a higher range column can you see from 100 it changed to 500 but when right. i do it on a lower range column from 100 it just changes to 100.01 so can yes. i say a column that has a higher range has a lot of influence currently yes why should i have this column having lot of influence is there any reason why size should matter more than bedrooms currently i don't think so let me keep the importance same na for all feature columns okay why yes. should i have a column having more influence as compared to some other feature column this should not happen okay so in my opinion this should not happen that a column having higher range has more influence over a column having lower range okay so to avoid this what to do okay 
let's go ahead and let's see guys okay to avoid this what you can do is you can use the concept of scaling okay you can use the concept of scaling and uh, let me show that to you with scaling what will happen is all the feature values will form within one range okay uh, the values of all feature columns will be converted into one range only okay so it will not be that uh, some feature column has very high range of values some feature column has very low range of values with that what could happen is the column having high range of values will always dominate the column having low range of values that should not happen so fine let's see how to avoid it for that what we'll do is we'll convert the feature columns to the same scale okay let's see how to do it there are many scaling techniques i will use one scaling technique over here called min max scaling and let me go ahead and let me show to you how it would work okay so suppose i have a feature column with me in which i have some values let's suppose the values are 10 20 30 10 20 and what i am trying to do is let's suppose i want uh, three rows in training two rows in testing let's assume these are the first three rows that go into training and the remaining last two rows go into training let's suppose even out of random selection this is what happens fine now let's go ahead now how do how does min max scaling work so remember in min max scaling what happens is minimum value gets converted to zero maximum value gets converted to one and the remaining values get converted using the formula x minus x min divided by x max minus x min okay fine remember that now going forward okay going forward uh, let's move forward over here so now i will need your help pranam over here i'll need your help first what i will do is on the training data i will apply something called scanning remember scanning is also known as fitting okay in machine learning terminology scanning is also known as fitting so if i say that i want to scan the training data set that means i can say that i want to apply fitting on the training data set so applying scanning on the training data set applying fitting on the training data set is one and the same thing okay so pranav what does fitting mean it's kind of scanning on the data. Correct. Scanning. So let's apply scanning on the training data set or let us apply fitting on the training data set. Let's do it. So if I do it, then scan your training data set over here, uh, Pranav, and let me know after scanning your training data set, what is the minimum value that you have in the training data set? Uh, I mean, it's number of records or minimum value is 10. 10. Correct. So currently I have five values uh, overall in my data set. Out of the five values, three values went to training two. Okay. So I said that, okay, from the values that you have in training data set, find the minimum value. And you correctly said that it was 10. Perfect. Now in the training data set, what is the maximum value? 30. 30. So currently I have only scanned the training data set. Okay. Fine. Now let's go ahead and uh, now what i will do is i'll go ahead and on the training data set let me do transformation transformation means actually applying the change fitting only means scanning in fitting no change is done in transformation we do a change in the value so now let's change the values so the value 10 will be changed to something uh, let me ask you pranav 10 value is it the minimum value in your head yes minimum value will always get converted to zero zero as per min max scaling it will get converted to zero 30 is it the maximum value in your head mm. one and as per min max scaling it will get converted to one one perfect 20 is it the minimum or maximum in your head no so it will get converted using this formula okay so it will be x minus x min minimum value is 10 divided by x max maximum value is 30 minus x min minimum value is 10 so this will be 10 divided by 20 which is equal to 0 0.5 okay so over here i will just write 0 0.5 okay fine now let's go ahead up till now pranav making sense yes so on the training data set the first thing that i had applied was scanning fitting correct second thing was transformation Trans Okay. 
now pranav let me go ahead on the testing data set also let me try to do the same although you will see a issue that will occur because of that and i will also show you the uh, solution to that issue but just like on the training data set i have done fitting and transformation both on the testing data set also let me do both but because of that we'll arrive at a issue and we'll see the solution to that issue fine so on testing data set let me apply fitting that means scanning so uh, pranav please scan the testing data set what is the minimum value in your testing data set 10 10 perfect let me write it over here 10 and pranav what is the maximum value in your testing data set 20 perfect okay now let's go ahead you have applied scanning on the testing data set that means you have applied fitting on the testing data set now let's apply transformation transformation means actually changing the values so on the testing data set will change the values so the value 10 it's the minimum Zero. value in your head right and as you know as per minimax scaling minimum value will get converted to 0 the value 20 is the maximum value in your head and as per the rule of min max scaling maximum value will get converted to 1 now have a look over here can i say pranav that in my training data set the value 20 was converted to 0.5 in the testing data set it was converted to 1 yes this should not happen why are same i mean same value should be converted to the same number na see Correct. whatever it is getting converted to in the testing data set it should be done in the same way in the training data set as well this mismatch should not happen okay this mismatch should not happen okay so for example just as a example pranav let's say in your uh, aadhar card you have written a name of pranav whereas in your uh, pan card you have a written a name of uh, purohit will that work no no na hmm. across data uh, if let's say you are a entity uh, you are a human being you should have the same name across all the places so similarly over here we have the value 20 it should be converted in the same uh, number across all the data sets whether it is training data set testing data set it should be converted in the same manner uh, pranav do you have a solution to this issue what can we do to avoid this issue divide uh... Ex divide fifty fifty in train and test with all possible combination, all possible feature column value. Okay, but uh, it that could work if I have less number of rows. What if I have crores of rows? Yeah. Then that might not work. What I want to do is whatever conversion is happening in the training data set, same conversion should happen in the testing data set as well. Yeah, so then min what, max value uh, should be same for train and test. Correct, correct, correct. And yes, that's the exact solution. And let's see how we do that. So what I'll do, uh, Pranav, is I will go back to a state where I was previously. Let me go back. Let me go back. Okay. So let's say you have only applied fitting and transformation on the training data set. Okay, Pranav, you have not done anything else. Let's say you have only applied fitting and transformation on the training data set. Now, Pranav, to avoid the issue that we had previously, we will make a promise, and that promise is that we will never ever apply fitting on the testing data set. On the testing data set, we will only apply transformation. So, Pranav, what is that promise that we will make? we will only apply transformation we will not scan fit correct we will not scan the testing data set we will not uh, fit on the testing data set fine all right so you will not uh, scan the testing data set and this is the result of scanning the training data set only so i have not scanned the testing data set up till now fine so we will not scan it fine let, let us not scan okay uh, pranav you agree with me right that this is the result of scanning the training data set yes yes okay. so let us not scan the testing data set now on testing data set we will directly apply transformation we will not apply scanning ever okay we will not apply scanning ever let's see what will happen because of that fine let's apply transformation so the value 10 is the minimum value in your head and as per min max scaling minimum value will get converted to 0 then the value 20 is neither the minimum value nor maximum value in your head so it will get converted using this formula so this will be 20 minus x min x min is 
divided by x max. X max is 30 minus x min, which is 10. So this will be 10 divided by 20, which is equal to 0 0.5. Okay. So now the value 20 is getting converted to 0 0.5. And have a look, Pranav, now. In the training data set and in the testing data set, the value 20, is it getting converted to same exact number? Hmm. Yes. Right? And how did we achieve this? We made a promise to ourselves that on training data set, we'll apply fit and transform both. But on testing data set, we should only apply transform. Transformation. Never ever apply fitting. Okay. Fine. So remember that. Uh, and let me show you whether doing this min max killing, whether this will satisfy the seven step or not. We wanted values to be on the same range. Let's see. After applying min max killing, will that happen or not? Okay, with this, can I say over here, Pranav? Uh, over here, can I say this was just with respect to one feature column? The values will be in the range of 0 to 1 mostly. Hmm. Can I say if I apply to the second feature column also, the values will range between 0 and 1? Correct, so yes. Right? So it will happen like that. And have a look. Let me show that to you. So what I will do is uh, from scale on folder, there is a file called preprocessing. And from that file, I have a class called min max scalar. Let me go ahead and let me call that class. And uh, when I do that, our object of this Python class will be created. Let me reference it by the variable scalar. Using this object, I will try to call this method called fit underscore transform, which will apply fitting and transformation both. Okay, and we know pronounce that on the training data set, we apply fitting and transformation both. But on testing data set, we only apply transform. Now, Pranav, if, before we go ahead, we know that this seven step that we are applying says that features should be on the same scale. So I'm only concerned that features should be on same scale. Other things, whether they are on the same scale or not, I don't care. I only care that features should be on the same scale. Pranav, my features were referenced by which variable earlier? Mm -hmm. X, X. X, right? X. Later, Pranav, can I say that X got split into two parts, X train and X test? Correct. So yes. I only care that X train and X test should be on the same scale. Other things I don't care. I only care that X train and X test should be on the same scale. Out of X train and X test, what is part of training? X train. Correct. So on X train, I will apply fit and transform both. As we know, on training data set, we'll apply fit and transform both. Out of X train and X test, as you know, X test is part of testing and uh, Pranav on the testing data set will only apply what? Transformation. Transform. Fine. Never apply fitting again. Only apply transform. With this, let's see what will happen. Okay. Let me show you the values. Currently, they will be in the form of array. I will convert it to a data frame just to explain it to you. Uh, just to prove to you that now all the values will be and the, uh, the, uh, the values in all the feature columns will be in the same range. We convert to a data frame. I'll get the column names also for you back. Okay, and have a look. You can cross check uh, the range and everything. You will see that uh, uh, the, all the values and feature columns will be on the same range. You can, uh, you know, check each and every detail over here for each and every rows. All the, all the some rows are train coded, but you can solve that issue as well. You can untruncate those rows and then check. And you will see all the uh, values of all the feature columns will be in the same range. With this, we'll solve the issue of scaling. So remember, scaling needs to be applied in two cases only. Okay, in two cases only. Or uh, I should say only in uh, uh, one case. Okay, uh, it should only be applied. in algorithms in uh, algorithms that require calculating distance using the feature values okay uh, where the absolute uh, uh, value of a feature uh, does affect uh, the performance of the algorithm. In that case only, you will apply uh, scaling. Okay, otherwise you will not apply scaling. So scaling should only be applied in algorithms 
uh, in which some distance calculation is required. Uh, however, in algorithms that are tree based, so you have many, many algorithms, for example, decision tree algorithm, random forest algorithm. In those algorithms, there is no need to apply scaling. Okay. In tree based algorithms, in tree based algorithms, like decision tree regressor, sorry, decision tree, uh, then uh, there are two more algorithms of decision tree, decision tree regressor and decision tree classifier. Then we have more. Okay, we have random forest regressor, random forest classifier. So like this, we have more and more tree based algorithms. Although today we won't get time to cover it, but in future when you will cover, remember that for those tree based algorithms, there is no re uh, requirement of uh, calculating distance. How do you know whether that algorithm requires calculating distance or not? You only know it if you know the theory of that algorithm. So for example, when we covered KNN, we know in KNN there is involvement of calculating distance. Okay. So in that scenario, uh, there was a need to make sure that features are on the same scale. Otherwise, there is no need to implement this step. But let's say even then, if you implement, it's not harmful for your model performance. Okay. So even though you apply scaling on um, uh, other algorithms that do not require uh, you to convert it to scheme scale, still it won't be harmful for your algorithm uh, for your model performance. Okay, but make sure that uh, it's only required only if they uh, only if you are implementing an algorithm that requires calculating distance using feature values. So KNN requires, so we applied it. Okay, there are algorithms which might not require. So uh, there we won't uh, focus on this step whatsoever. Anyways, here we have done it. Here we have implemented the seventh step. Okay, let me move on to the eighth step. Eighth step is to train. Ha, over here, I guess Lakshmi has a doubt. So yes, Lakshmi, I, have you put some doubt in the chat? Let me check. Ha. Now, Saravanan has a doubt about overfitting. Okay. So yes, Saravanan, I will explain overfitting to you as well. It's a theoretical concept uh, and I will explain how to see uh, how, how does it work and how you can check for it in code as well. Okay, I will explain it ahead. But for now, forget overfitting, underfitting uh, in, in these steps. Yes, going forward, I will explain that to you uh, what it is. Lakshmi has a doubt. Lakshmi mentioned scaling should be applied in algorithms that require uh, calculating distance using feature values. Uh, it's it's not required, Lakshmi. In tree-based algorithms, it's not required. But let's say if you apply it, you are not doing any harm to your model performance. It will still be the same. The model performance will still be the same. Uh, in tree-based algorithms, if you apply or do not apply. So it's better to not apply, no? If it doesn't affect. This is due to internet issue, but fine. So Saramanan, for you, I will explain what is overfitting, underfitting. Okay. Uh, and uh, it's not that it helps you to uh, increase the accuracy. It's just that 
you check for it so that uh, you know that okay there is a issue with the model and if there is a issue with the model you will tune the model settings again okay so that you avoid overfitting and underfitting overfitting and underfitting is a problem and what is that problem what do you mean by overfitting underfitting i'll show that to you okay cannot hear me Asha, so uh, uh, was i audible when i said that uh, uh, yes, uh, scaling should not be applied on tree-based algorithms. It should only be applied on algorithms where calculation of distance is there uh, using the feature values. Only then it should be applied. In tree-based algorithms, it should not be applied. There is no need. But even if you apply in tree-based algorithms, you are not doing any harm to your model performance. Okay, it will still be the same regardless whether you apply it or not. So if you if you apply it, if there is no change whatsoever, so why to apply it na? in tree-based algorithms? So in tree-based algorithms, it doesn't matter the range of your feature values. It only matters in algorithms where calculation of distance is involved. Lakshmi, clear? I don't know whether I was audible or not. Is it clear? Guys, other guys? I don't know. I'm not able to get... Clear? Okay. Fine. All right. Let's go ahead. And Saravan, and I'll come to your doubt, right? Uh, okay. I'll make sure that you that I explain you that issue at the end. Okay. Uh, although I will not remember it, but uh, do remind me at the end. Okay. Once I cover the algorithms, I'll show you what is that problem of overfitting. What is that problem of underfitting? I'll explain that with the help of a movie example so that you understand it. Correct. Fine. All right. Let's go ahead. So now coming to our eighth step, guys. Eighth step. Seventh step is already done. Eighth step is to train the model on the training data set. So let's go ahead and let's train the model over here. So what we'll do is uh, in order to train the model, we'll have to uh, create uh, the model first. So from SKL1 folder, there is a file called neighbors. From that file, I have a class called K neighbors classifier. I hope that's the name of the class. And now I'm not and I'm not doing any spelling mistake. If at all there's some spelling mistake, we'll see what to do. Fine, there was no spelling mistake. Okay. Let's go ahead. Now let me call the class so that a mod model is made. Remember, in this line of code, I'm not training the model. I'll be training it ahead. In this line of code, I'm just creating the model. Okay. So it's just like, for example, if I want to train uh, Navin, then before training Navin, Navin should be created first on Earth, right? Then once he is created on Earth, then I can uh, do training. Uh, then I can give training to him. Just like that, before this model, before I apply training to the model, that model should be existent. It should be created first. Okay. Right. So let's uh, create the model. Uh, over here, while creating the model, I'll uh, give the uh, values for model settings. So let me give a value of five to number of neighbors. And uh, for distance formula, let me use this formula called Euclidean. Okay. So there were two important uh, settings uh, to specify in KNN algorithm. I have done that. With this, what will happen is that the model will be created. Currently, I have an issue. And that issue is that there is a spelling mistake in my code. Let me correct that spelling mistake. And after that, this code will work. Okay, now let me train the model on the training data set. Uh, now, let me take, uh, okay, let me ask Saravanan. So Saravanan, let's say if I'm asking you to train on the textbook, can I say you will need to scan the textbook? Agreed? Yes, okay. Agreed, Saravanan, I don't know whether you enter this right now. Sorry, this was your previous message. So Saravan, and what I'm asking is, if I ask you to train on the textbook, can I say you will have to scan the content in the textbook? Yes or no, guys? What do you think? If I ask you to train on the textbook, you will have to scan the content in the textbook. Yes. What is another word for scanning in machine learning? Scanning is also known as... What is another word for scanning in machine learning? Fitting. Yes, as Saravan and mentioned, scanning is also known as pretty fitting, as Pranav says. Scanning is also known as fitting. So let us apply fitting. On what? We need to train the model on the training data set. 
So we need to apply fitting on the training data set. And Pranav, out of the four things that you got out of train test split, which things belong to your training data set? Uh, X underscore train, then uh -huh. uh, Y underscore train. Perfect. X train and Y train. You will pass these two things over here. X train and the second thing that you mentioned was Y train. Done with this training is done, guys. Here, since I had a very, le very less rows in training data set, training didn't take a lot of time. Okay, as more and more rows increase in the training data set, the training time time might increase. Okay, fine. A step done. Training is done. Now, last step: test the model on the testing data set. Fine. So let's test the model over here. Uh, so for that, I will call a method called score on the model. And remember, we need to test the model on the testing data set. So again, a question to Pranav. Pranav, out of the four things that you got in train test split, which things belong to your testing data set? Uh, X test, Y test, X underscore test, Y underscore test. Perfect. And I'll pass those two things that Pranav has mentioned in my code over here. With this, I will get an accuracy score. Accuracy will always be between 0 to 1. OK, it will always be between 0 to 1. Uh, for your classification model to be acceptable, your accuracy score should at least be greater than or equal to 0 0.7. OK, that means in percentage terms, the accuracy should at least be greater than or equal to 70 percentage. And let's see what is the accuracy over here. Uh, uh, what is the accuracy over here, Pranav, in percentage terms? 100. 100%. So it says that, OK, while testing on the testing data set, my model was 100% accurate. Right. So your uh, Pranav, did I apply hyperparameter tuning at all? Did I apply any hyperparameter tuning method like grid search hyperparameter tuning, random search hyperparameter tuning? Did I do that? Mm, no, no, na? no, we no. didn't do it. OK, uh, however, if, if our performance was bad, Let's say Pranav, if our, this performance would have been bad, na, then I would have done it. So for example, Pranav, let's say if I switch on a TV, okay, what I what, what do I generally do? I always set the TV volume to 50. And let's say at 50, if I'm not able to listen properly, then you will uh, uh, reduce the volume or increase the volume, correct? Yes. So your first increase. thing is correct. Uh, then you will increase the volume or decrease the volume. Similarly, I will first start off with the values that I feel could be correct for this data. If that does not work, then I will try to tune tune the values, right? And then I, I can apply hyperparameter tuning, okay? But first, I will just start with some random values. I will see how, how is it looking like. If I see that, okay, with these random values that I have passed, it is not working, then I will apply those hyperparameter tuning methods like grid search hyperparameter tuning, random search hyperparameter tuning. Although they are not foolproof, but still it's better uh, than nothing, right? Uh, so I can do that and apply it later on. However, here there was no scope to use that because my model performance is the best, 100%. There cannot be a score greater than 100%. So this is good. Okay. But now, Pranav, why did I create this model? Just for time pass or why did we create the model? What is the use of creating the model? We can use the model for what purpose prediction predict we can uh, for prediction correct so there are two uses only first is to obtain inferences from data second is as pranav mentioned to obtain predictions from data so let's say i want to predict i want to do some prediction over here let's see how, how to do it prediction okay so fine uh, i will have some data on which i will do the prediction so let's say in that data, I have one row. One second. In that data, let's assume I have one row. Uh, the sepal length value. Let's, okay, give me some value for uh, the first feature column, uh, uh, Pranav. Mm, 5.2. 5.2, okay. So I'll just mention it. 5.2. For the second feature column, give me some value. Mm, 4. Then for the third feature column, give me some value. Uh, 3.2. 3.2. Okay. Then for the fourth and last feature column, any value? Mm, 2.1. 2.1. Okay. 
fine and this is the data on which i want to perform prediction okay fine all right here it is now uh, i have one row of data so that means pranav my model will predict how many target value one one if there was two rows of data to predict on it would have predicted two target values if there were five rows of data to predict on it would have predicted five target values and so on fine but before doing prediction there are two points that you need to satisfy before performing prediction there are two points that you need to satisfy first point is the number of the number and names of columns in the features and in the data to to predict should match okay so if the first column and feature was sepal and centimeter in the data to predict also it is sepal and centimeter and so on so name should match number should match so if in my over features add four feature columns then in the data to predict also i should have four columns okay so that is one point second point is the same changes that i applied on the features the same needs to be applied on the data that i want to predict on okay so uh, first point i guess is already satisfied we have already taken care of this first point second point let's see the second once i got my features i got my feet okay sorry guys i guess there was some internet issue let me change my internet connection okay i hope i am back so coming back to our points that we needed to satisfy before doing prediction so over here out of the two points that we need to satisfy first point is already satisfied okay we need to move on to the second point second point says same changes that i applied on the features same needs to be applied on the data that i want to predict so uh, let's see what changes that i have applied on my features i got my features at this step after this any change i have done in the feature values you are any change in feature values no you are any change in feature values no you are any change no you are any change no in sixth step any change in feature values no we are just splitting the feature values no change in the values as such okay what about scaling pranav in scaling do we do a change in feature values yes yes so my feature values have gone through scaling that's why the data that i want to predict on should also go through scaling so here i will apply scaling on the data that i want to predict fine after scaling there is no other change that my features has gone through so that's it my features had only gone through one change which is scaling so in the data that i want to predict on i will also apply scaling now my model is ready to make prediction remember uh, the target value is species and there are three species of iris flowers okay either the species will be iris setosa or the species will be iris versicolor or the species will be iris virginica these are the only three species of iris flowers and your model should predict one out of these three species okay let's see whether it does that or not let me predict on this data over here and let's see whether it predicts the species of the flower and over here it does predict the species of the flower remember there was just one row of data to predict on so it predicted only one target value for that row let's say if there were two rows of data to predict on it would have predicted two total target values one for the first row second for the second row and so on let me show that to you so let me have a second row as well let me have a second row as well over here and for that you will see that uh, we will get two target values and as you can see you get two target values over here okay for two rows of data you get uh, you have two target values predicted okay fine with this pranav and everybody else is the implementation of knn clear yes yes okay 
so before the lunch break we saw the theory of knn now after the lunch break we saw its practical implementation fine so let's do one thing let's take a short break uh, after the break we'll come back and we'll move on to our second algorithm for today okay our first algorithm was knn now after the break we'll move on to our second algorithm okay so based on this guys what we did oh, up till now there are many questions that can come related to stratification related to scaling and all of that okay fine anyways uh, let's take a short break uh, we'll come back at 4 pm uh, wherein we'll uh, and after 4 pm we'll move on to our second algorithm of today fine so we have already worked with the first algorithm called knn now after the break we'll move on to our second algorithm so let's take a 20 minute break okay and we'll come back at 4 pm and uh, we'll move on to our second algorithm till then i'll just be on mute okay and after that we'll come back
Welcome back to this session, everyone. Hope all of you are back after the break. Just put a confirmation in the chat so that we can move forward. Everybody is back, guys. Saravana and Lakshmi. Yes, you can see Pragna has raised the hand, so she is back. Okay. Fine. All right, let's move forward and let's move on to our second algorithm for today. The first algorithm that we covered was called K nearest neighbors. Now it's time to move on to a second algorithm called multinomial naive bias. The name of the algorithm is multinomial naive bias. Okay, multinomial naive bias. Now you might wonder this algorithm is used for which purpose? Is it used for supervised learning purpose or is it used for unsupervised learning purpose? Well, this algorithm is used for supervised learning purpose. And within supervised, it is used for which purpose? Classification or regression. So it is used for classification purpose over here. Okay, so that is what naive bias is used for. It is used for supervised learning purpose, and within supervised, it is used for classification purposes. Okay, fine. That means in order for naive bias to work, the target column should have finite set of possibilities in it. Okay, let's move forward. Let's see the working of this algorithm. Now, in order to understand this, I will need help of one student. So let me take help of that student over here. I'll need help of Jaikesh. So Jaikesh, please help me out. Uh, I will unmute your mic and Jaikesh, I will need your help uh, in order to explain this to everyone. So let me allow you to speak over the mic. I guess I've given you one second. So Jaikesh. I guess I've given you the mic access. Now, JKS, let's move forward. So, JKS, let's suppose I have a data set containing emails. And in those emails, I have a total of 12 emails with me. Out of 12 emails, out of 12 emails, let's suppose eight emails are normal emails, and four of them are spam emails. Okay, so Jaikesh, over your uh, the question that I'm asking is in such a scenario wherein the either uh, the email is either a normal email or a spam email. Let's say you want to predict it. Now, just the question over your Jaikesh, can I say your uh, email uh, uh, portals like Gmail or Outlook? Can I say they already have a machine learning model inbuilt into them? That predicts correct. whether your incoming email is a normal email or a spam one. Correct? Correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. So let's say we want to build a similar model like that. How will we build it? Let's see. So in total, we have a data set containing 12 emails. Out of 12 emails, guys, how many? Uh, sorry, out of 12 emails, Jaikesh, how many belonging to no, uh, how many belong to normal category? It's a eight email, and four is a, four four is a spam. Perfect. So out of 12 emails, eight belong to normal category, four belong to spam category. Now let's move forward. So JK is just a uh, in general question I'm asking. Uh, forget machine learning. Let's say if uh, uh, I showed you an email and if I ask you to predict whether this particular email that you see is a spam email or a normal email, what is the uh, 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 working that you will apply? What is the logic that you will apply? To arrive at your domain, prediction. Uh, so domain uh, side need to check it is a uh -huh. uh, correct domain or not. Okay. Right. And can I say looking at the email first, you will calculate the probability of that email belonging to normal category. Then you will calculate the probability of that email belonging to spam category. Whichever yes. probability is higher, you will say that, okay, this email belongs to that particular category. Agreed with me, Jaikesh? Correct, correct. Okay. The same thing we will do over here, buddy. Let's see how to do it. So first I will focus on normal emails, Jaikesh. So let me focus on normal emails over here. Let me do that. Let me focus on uh, normal emails. So Jaikesh, uh, I know out of 12 emails, eight were normal. So Based on the count of the words in the normal emails, I have created this histogram, okay, which suggests that in my normal emails, the word dear has occurred eight times. 
the word friend has occurred five times the word lunch has occurred three times and so on okay like this i have created a histogram let's suppose in our normal image these were the only four unique words let us assume just for simplicity that these were the only four unique words and based on the count of the words in normal emails, I have created this histogram. Okay. Now, I have a question. The question to Jaikesh is, Jaikesh, please help me to calculate the probability of the word dear in a normal email. So, Jaikesh, I guess you are on mute. Please help me to calculate the probability of dear on a normal email. A normal email, uh, Okay, so in total, how many words do we have in, in my normal email? 12. Uh, total, if you count total, all total the... Eight, uh, total 8 uh, in a, a normal email. Ha, 8 emails were there. But in those 8 emails, I will have different, different words. Correct, dear, friend, ha. and yeah. Correct, so suppose these were the only 4 unique words. Let's assume. Although in real life, you will have a lot of unique words across your eight emails, eight normal emails. But let's suppose just for simplicity, these were the only four unique words. And Jaikesh, based on count of the words in normal emails, you have created this histogram that the word dear is occurring eight times. The word friend is occurring five times and so on. So first what I will do is I'll calculate the probability of obtaining the word dear in a normal email. How will I do that? So in my normal email, what is the total count of all the words? Year is occurring eight times. Friend, friend is occurring 17. five times. 17. 17. Perfect, perfect. 17. Out of 17, the word dear is occurring how many times? It's eight times. So can I say probability of obtaining dear in a normal email will be eight by 17? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Fine, so it will be 8 by 70. Similarly, Jayakesh, probability of obtaining the word friend in a normal email will be? So 5 times. Correct, so 5 by 17. Yeah. Right. Similarly, probability of obtaining the word lunch in a normal email will be 3 by 17. And probability of obtaining the word money in a normal email will be 1 by 17. We have done this. Now, let's focus on spam emails, buddy. So based on the count of the words, count of the same words in spam emails, I have created this histogram that the word dear is occurring two times in spam emails. The word friend is occurring one time in spam email. The word lunch is occurring zero times in spam email. The word money is occurring four times in a spam email. Okay, now let's move forward. So can you tell me, uh, Jay Kesh, the probability of obtaining the word, probability of obtaining the word dear in a spam email, what will it be? Two times. Two by? Two by uh, 17. Seven, no? Uh, no, no. In my spam email, you see the word dear is occurring two times. Friend is occurring one time. Lunch is occurring zero times. Money is occurring four times. So in spam email, total count of words, can I say is two plus one plus zero plus four? Correct. So seven. Seven. Perfect. So the probability of obtaining the word dear in a spam email will be 2 by 7. Similarly, probability of obtaining the word friend in a spam email will be 1 by 7. The probability of obtaining the word lunch in a spam email will be 0 by 7. And probability of obtaining the word money in a spam email will be 4 by 7. Okay, fine. And like this, I'll calculate their probabilities. Up till now, making sense to you, Jaikesh? Yes, correct. Yes, now. Jaikesh, as I declared to you earlier, that total you have a total of 12 emails. Out of 12 emails, how many were normal emails? 8 emails. 8 were normal and 4 were spam. Perfect. So, if I ask you, Jaikesh, to calculate the probability of obtaining a normal email, what will it be? Uh, 8 by 17, uh, 12, no, no. sorry. Ha, 8 by 12, right? that uh, total number of normal emails is 8 out of total of how many emails? 12. So probability of normal email will be 8 by 12. Similarly, probability of spam email will be? 4 by 12. Perfect. And you can see same calculation we have done over here. That probability of obtaining a normal email will be 8 by 12. Probability of obtaining a spam email will be 4 by 12. Now, let's move forward. 
next what i will do is i will have a email shown to me now on that email i will calculate the probability of that particular email belonging to normal category and then i will calculate the probability of that particular email belonging to spam category for whichever category the probability is higher i will say that okay this email belongs to that particular category let's see so suppose buddy i have a email received by me which has two words in it dear friend two words okay only two words for simplicity we are only taking two words okay however the uh, concept that i will explain to you will apply regardless of how many words you have in your email okay suppose for simplicity i have received a email containing two words dear friend now what i will do i'll calculate its probability belonging to normal category and i will calculate its probability belonging to spam category let me do that but remember a note over here since we are calculating probability using a will be calculating a probability over here using a formula called bayesian formula in bayesian formula it's not necessary that the sum of the probabilities will come up to 1 normally what happens is you calculate probabilities so the sum of their probabilities come up to 1 so for example let's say if i say that uh, what is the probability of india winning in a india pakistan game so you will say 0.8 that means 80% and what is the probability of pakistan winning in a india pakistan game so you'll say 0.2 or 20% so 0.8 and 0.2 if you add them it sums out to be 1 like that's how normal probabilities work but in bayesian formula the probabilities that you get it doesn't sum out to 1 so just a side note just just to keep in mind let me show you how that bayesian formula works so suppose uh, jay kesh i have a email received to me uh, in that email i just have two words dear friend let's suppose So what I will do? First, I will calculate probability of this email belonging to normal category. How to do it? Let's see. So what is, I will have probability of obtaining a normal email into probability of obtaining the word friend in a normal email into probability of sorry. Uh, I repeat myself. Uh, first, I will have probability of obtaining a normal email into probability of obtaining the word dear in a normal email into probability of obtaining the word friend in a normal email. i will just go ahead and substitute the values i have already found out found out the values over here i'll just go ahead and substitute them okay and that's how i get probability of this particular email belonging to normal category okay similarly let's go ahead similarly i will calculate the probability of this email belonging to spam category so uh, i will have probability of obtaining a spam email into probability of obtaining the word <coughs> dear in a spam email into probability of obtaining the word friend in a spam email i'll just substitute their values and i <coughs> at the end i will get to know the total probability of obtaining a spam email over here so now jaykesh you let me know which probability is higher the probability of obtaining the email in a normal category or probability of obtaining the email in a spam category which is higher the first one like 0.09 correct so probability of this email belonging to normal category is higher right yes, this yes. was the calculation done for a normal email below was the calculation done more for a spam email and you know the probability that you obtained for a normal email the probability of this email belong to normal category is higher as compared to probability of this email belonging to spam category the probability of this email belong to normal category is higher so what will the models prediction be the models prediction will be that okay since the probability of this email belonging to normal category is higher that's why this email belongs to normal email category okay so is it understood jaykesh how your uh, multinomial naive bayes algorithm works yes 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 okay fine so this algorithm was de uh, developed way back okay uh, 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 this bayesian uh, formula i should say was developed way back uh, somewhere around 1970s or 1980s okay so this is how it works basically fine let me go ahead and let me implement this we have seen the theory of this algorithm called multinomial naive bayes now let's go ahead and let's see its implementation okay so it's time to see its implementation let's see so uh, jaykesh just one last question uh this multinomial naive bias algorithm is used for which category of model supervised or unsupervised uh, 
uh, not sure for it uh, see uh, if a algorithm requires the usage of teachers and target both then it's a supervised learning algorithm yeah, correct yeah if the algorithm only requires usage of features it does not require a target then it's unsupervised it's unsupervised right how see i had emails in the emails i knew they are labels na whether they are normal yeah. or spam so i knew their target values already yes correct yeah okay. no supervised right so this will be supervised so any algorithm that is used for supervised learning category any algorithm that is used for supervised learning category to implement it we have these nine steps let's see okay so uh, let me first uh, get the data on which i'll be applying this algorithm over here so i have data of some tweets and what i will do is i will train my uh, model over here based on those tweets uh, so in the data that i have with me some of the tweets have been written by donald trump some of the tweets have been written by justin trudeau okay and i want to predict i want to let my model predict seeing a tweet whether that tweet was written by donald trump or whether that tweet was written by justin trudeau okay i want my uh, model to tell me that i want the model to train itself and later help me to predict whether a tweet is written by donald trump or whether a tweet is written by justin trudeau so over here i have many columns with me the last column contains the actual tweets the second last column contains information about author of the tweets all the other columns are useless for me so it doesn't matter okay bye uh now let's go ahead the first step you know to see the implementation is to make sure that data is clean so there are many things that we see in cleaning one thing that we see is that it should not have any missing values let's go ahead and check if there are missing values or not and on checking on checking over here we observe that there are no missing values whatsoever the first column has zero missing values second column has zero missing values all the other columns have zero missing values so that's good second step is to extract the features and targets separately so let's go ahead and let us extract the features and targets separately over here okay so we'll go ahead and do it let's extract the features and targets separately remember uh that here my target column is what my target is to predict the author of the tweet right my target is to predict author of the tweet so this author column will be my target column this author column will be my target column fine this will be my target column then what will be my feature column so the column that contains the tweets that will be my feature column so the tweet will help me to predict who, who is the author okay so this tweet column this last column over here will be my feature column fine so it will be my feature column over here all right now let's go ahead now uh, what i will do is uh, i want to go ahead and uh, uh, move on to my next step my next step is what my next step is to make sure that features should be of numeric nature so let's go ahead and check if they are of numeric nature or not okay uh, here if you have a look at your feature column you can see your feature column that you have with uh, you over here this is your feature column you can have a look at your feature column and you tell me is my feature column numeric or non numeric which type of column is it you can say it is non numeric right your feature column that you have with you it is non numeric agreed it is non numeric right i have one feature column only okay there is my feature column whereas the other column is my target column the remaining columns are useless for me if you have a look at my feature column you can see it is a non numeric feature column so in order to convert it into numeric i will have to apply some steps okay let's see how to do it how to convert a non numeric feature column into a numeric feature column okay so if you have a non numeric feature column first you need to check whether that non numeric feature column is having finite set of possibilities or in other words is it discrete in nature okay discrete in nature means a column having finite set of possibilities so you need to check whether that non numeric feature column is discrete in nature or it is continuous in nature 
if it is discrete in nature okay if it is discrete in nature then you have two main techniques that you can choose from there are others also but there are two main techniques first is called one hot encoding second is called dummy encoding so an example of non numeric uh, feature column that is discrete in nature could be something like gender so gender uh, if you have a gender as a feature column gender is non numeric feature column and gender has finite set of possibilities or infinite set of possibilities well gender has finite set of possibilities right two possibilities in gender either male or female okay so that gender is an example of non numeric discrete feature column and in order to convert such a column to numeric you will either apply one not encoding and dummy encoding there are other techniques but the main ones main ones are one not encoding and dummy encoding okay on the other hand if you have a continuous non numeric feature column then again there are some techniques there are many techniques are the two main ones the two widely used ones are count vectorizer and tf idf vectorizer count vectorizer and tf idf vectorizer okay fine so i will need your help uh, jaykesh so jaykesh please let me know whether the feature column that we are working with this is my feature column over here okay this is my feature column have a look at my feature column it is non numeric yes but uh, that non numeric feature column is it discrete in nature or continuous in nature uh, discrete in nature because different discrete means a, a, a column having finite set of possibilities continuous means a column having infinite set of possibilities so as far as my feature column is concerned there i am storing my tweets do i have finite set of possibilities in tweets or infinite set of possibilities what do you think jaykesh finite or infinite it's a like limited here right yeah no no in the data anyways it will be limited because whether you are having uh, 400 tweets in your data or 4 lakh tweets in your data but in general i am asking in general not sure no no a tweet let's say you are writing a tweet can i say mm. you have infinite set of possibilities to create a no, tweet no no it's a finite no no see i i mean you can write any words na in your tweet correct correct or let's say you are writing a youtube comment do you have can you write a youtube comment only in finite set of possibilities no no in infinite any infinite any anything you can type as a youtube comment similarly in a tweet also anything you can type na correct yeah you have infinite set of possibilities so currently you have a feature column that has infinite set of possibilities so that means your feature column can i say is a non numeric feature column but continuous in nature jaykesh yes right infinite set of possibilities that means continuous in nature so you have two ways to convert such a column to numeric what are those two ways count vectorize or in infinite vectorize uh, uh, count vectorizer and tf idf vectorizer yeah. okay okay count vectorizer and tf idf vectorizer fine so let's see how it works so suppose uh, let me show you how count vectorizer works okay let me show you how count vectorizer works so suppose i have a feature column with me in which i have written some of my tweets okay let's see the first tweet that i have written it says that cricket okay or i will say uh cricket is exciting or cricket is a sport uh in the second tweet i have written sport of cricket sport of cricket is a exciting sport so fine total i have two tweets in my feature column or i should say i have two rows in my feature column in each row i have written one tweet okay in each row i have written one tweet over here fine so let's go ahead uh now i will need your help jaykesh jaykesh can you tell me in my non numeric feature column 
कैन यू काउंट दी टोटल नंबर ऑफ यूनिक वर्ड्स यूनिक वर्ड्स यस व्हाट आर दे सो दिस इज यूनिक राइट इज इट आल्सो इज हां राइट सो करंटली 4 5 6 Okay, I can see six. Correct, six unique words. Correct, correct. Yeah. Okay. So since I have six unique words, I will create six new columns. If I had sixty unique words, I would have created sixty new columns. If I had two thousand unique words, I would create two thousand unique columns. Okay. But here I have six unique words, so I will create six new columns. Okay, one column for each unique word. One column for each unique word let's see okay fine now let's go ahead okay now uh, in the first row the word cricket is written how many times two times in the first row uh, one time one time perfect in the first row the word is is written one time one time in the first row uh, the word uh, a is written one time in the first row the word sport is written one time but in the first row the word off is written how many times two times no no in the first row the word off off is written how many times the off is not written correct so zero times correct. right zero then in the first row this is the first row in the first row the word exciting is written how many times zero zero now going forward in the go let's go to the second row in the second row the word cricket is written one time in the second row the word is is written one time in the second row the word uh, a is written one time in the second row the word sport is written how many times two times Two times. In the second row, the word uh, "off" is written one time. In the second row, the word "exciting" is written one time. Okay. And with this, have I converted my non-numeric values to numeric values now? Have I done that, Jaykesh? Yes. In the process, I ended up with more columns than what I had before, but that's fine. I have converted my non-numeric values to numeric values. Okay. Okay. Fine. Let's go ahead. Now, third step was to make sure that features are of numeric nature. So let's do that. Let's make sure that features are of numeric nature over here. So, uh, for that, what I will do is I will need help of a class which I will import. So from feature, uh, so so sorry, from SQL on folder, there is another subfolder called feature extraction. From that subfolder, I have a file called text. Inside that file, I have a class called count vectorizer. Now I'll go ahead and call that class, and uh, uh, over here when I call the class, with that what will happen is count vectorizer process will be ready to do work. So let me ask it to do work. Okay, I will say that okay, uh, scan the entire uh, feature column, okay, which is referenced by a variable x, and also apply the changes that you want to do in the values. Fine. So let's say if there are two thousand five hundred unique words in that feature column, then two thousand five hundred uh, new columns will be created. Okay, and have a look. Let's see what happens over here. And you can see there are there were around two thousand five hundred unique words in the feature column. So two thousand five hundred uh, columns have been created over here. Okay. Fine. Now let's go ahead. Uh, fourth step will be that it should be of the type array or data frame. It is. Fifth step is that it should have some rows and columns. We have already checked it has some rows and columns. So let's directly move to step six. Step six is to make sure that we split the data set into two parts: training and testing. Okay, so let's do that. So from a scale on folder, there is a file called uh, model selection. From that file, I have a function called train test split. Okay, so I will import that function and. Uh, Let me correct my spelling mistake so that the code works. Now, after importing the function, I will call it. The first thing that I will pass is my features referenced by a variable x. The next thing that I will pass is my target referenced by a variable y. 
then I'll use the test size parameter and to that I'll pass a value of 0 0.2. That means 20% of the data will go for testing, the remaining 80% will go for training. Then uh, I will use the random state parameter just to make sure that uh, every time when I run the code, I get the same set of rows and training and testing. Okay, so let me pass any random state uh, seed value over here. Okay, remember that the seed value that you are passing today, you need to pass the same seed value later on as well. So that today and later on, you get same set of rows in training and testing. Then there was one other thing we did in train test split. Anybody remembers that? There was one other thing that we did in train test split. Anybody remembers that, guys? What is that other thing that we did? In train test split. Any other thing we did? Stratification, right? As Sweta and Pranav are saying, stratification. So let me apply stratification. We know that stratification is applied on my target column. My target column is referenced by variable y. So let me apply it on my target column, referenced by variable y. Will this with this train test split function will do the work? First, it will split my features referenced by variable x into two parts. So I'll get x train and x test. Then I will uh, have my target reference by variable y split it into two parts. So I'll get y train and y test. With this, my sixth step will be done. Moving on to step number seven, which is to make sure features are on the same scale. Guys, if you remember this, I told you earlier, this step you only need to do in those algorithms where there is some involvement of calculating distance on feature values. Here guys, in this algorithm called multinomial naive bias, in the working, did you ever see any distance being calculated using feature values? Did you ever see any distance being calculated? In multinomial naive bias, guys, did you ever see in the working distance calculated using feature values? Did you ever see it? No, right? As Pranav mentioned, no. Yeah, I showed you the working of multinomial naive bias algorithm. There was no involvement of calculating distance on the feature value. So that's why your seven step does not apply. Okay, it does not, does not apply. So we'll move on to step number eight, which is to make sure that we train the model on the training data set. So let's do it. Let's train the model on the training data set. So for that, we'll have to create the model. From on folder, there is a file called uh, Nave bias. From that, I will import this class called multinomial NB. Okay, let me call the class so that a model will be created. Remember with this line of code, it will not be trained, but it will be created. Okay, fine. Uh, now let me train it. In order to train it, I'll call the fit method just like I did earlier. Okay, so just like earlier, what did we do? We trained a model on the training data set, if you remember. Okay, here it is. We trained our model on the training data set. Same code, same code I'll use in this file also. Train my model on the training data set. With this, Step eight will be done. Then step nine, which is to test the model on the testing data set. So in my previous coding file, what did I do? I use the score method on the testing data set, right? Now also I'll do the same thing. Remember, I'll get an accuracy value between zero and one. For a classification model to be acceptable, its accuracy should at least be greater than or equal to 0 0.7. That means accuracy in percentage terms should at least be greater than or equal to 70%, okay? Let's see whether it is greater than 0 0.7 or not. Okay, whether the accuracy is between uh, is greater than or equal to 0 0.7 or not. And yes, it is greater than or equal to 0 0.7. So our model is acceptable. Fine. Now, Pranav, uh, why did we why do we create a model just for time pass or what is the use of creating a model? What is the use to do what? Uh, to do two things, right? First is to obtain inferences on data. Second is to obtain predictions from data, right? I guess Pranav is trying to say predictions, right? So you want to get predictions from data. Fine. Let's predict. So suppose if I have a tweet saying uh, CNN is fake news. So guys, if you follow geopolitics, you would know this, that who is more likely to tweet this? Donald Trump or Justin Trudeau? Who is more likely to tweet this? Donald Trump or Justin Trudeau? Who is more likely to tweet? Okay, if you don't follow zero politics, no issues. Uh, there's a common tweet that Trump has made. He used to talk a lot about uh, CNN back in his days. 
Okay, so such a tweet is more likely to be tweeted by Donald Trump. Let's see if my model also thinks the same. Okay, but before we go ahead and do any predictions, there are two important points to note. There are two important points. Okay, first is that the same changes that I've applied on the features, the same needs to be applied on the data that I want to predict on. So let's say there's the data that I want to predict on. Okay, there's the data that I want to predict on. Fine. So same changes uh, that I applied on the features, same I will apply on the data that I want to predict on. So let's say in the data that I want to predict, it's a tweet. So previously also I had tweets, right, which were referenced by variable X. Now on this, did I do any change? Yes. Uh, on my tweets, I applied count vectorizer, right? So that is why on this data that I want to predict, there also I will apply count vectorizer. So let me do that. Let me apply count vectorizer over here. Okay. So I will apply count vectorizer. Fine. Let me apply it. With this, what will happen is uh, all the changes that I applied one second. Currently, I have an error. Let's try to understand what is that error. Okay. The code works now. Okay. So I guess previously it was referenced by different variable and, and I did run that code earlier. Okay, not an issue. I have done it now, so it works. Okay, first uh, thing done. After vectorizer, I don't think I have done any change on the tweet as such. Okay, fine. Next, the number of uh, the number and names of columns and features and in the data to predict should match. Okay, fine. Even if you focus on the number, that's fine enough. In my features, how many columns did I have? 2,528. Now, in the data that I want to predict, how many columns do I have? Let's see. Again, 2528. So it is matching. Okay, fine. Even if you focus on number, that's fine. There are a number and order of columns. Okay, fine. All right. Uh, now, let's go ahead and let's do our main prediction now. So, just like before, what did we do? We took our model, then apply a predict method on it, and we'll predict the data that I I uh, want to use for prediction purposes. And it should predict whether this tweet has been made by Donald Trump or whether it is made by Justin Trudeau. Okay. Hopefully, it should say Donald Trump. Let's check. Uh, and over here, it does say Donald Trump over here. Okay. Fine. Uh, like this, let me take some real life tweet. Okay. Remember, in my data set, I might have some tweets that are not written in English. For example, here you see a tweet. This is not written in English. This is written in. Uh, uh, French language, I believe. Okay, so let me go to uh, Justin Trudeau's Twitter account and take one of his tweets and let me pass it to the model and see whether it is predicting correctly or not. Okay, uh, I will take a tweet in French language. Now I know that uh, uh, Trudeau is more likely to tweet in French. Okay, not Trump. Trudeau is more likely to tweet in French. So let me take one of his French tweets over here. I'll copy it and paste it in my code. I'll copy and paste it in my code. OK, so I have done that. Now let's see. Uh, this tweet was actually made by Justin Trudeau. Let's see whether my model also thinks the same. You can see my model also thinks the same, that this tweet was made by Justin Trudeau. OK, but remember that, uh, yes, up till now our model is performing well, but uh, our model is trained on very, very less number of examples. Okay. In total, if I remember, I had 400 rows or 400 examples, out of which 20% of the rows I passed to testing. So that means out of 400, if I pass 20% to testing, that means 80 rows I have passed to testing. The remaining 320 rows I kept for training. So it is only trained on 320 tweets, 320 examples or 320 rows. Okay, which is very less. In real world, you try to train it on lakhs and lakhs of rows. Okay, fine. So up till now it is working well, but uh, in your office when you will implement this, make sure that you have uh, train it on as many examples as possible. Okay, so understood the implementation of our second algorithm also, guys. Yes. Yes or no? Made sense, guys. If there is any doubt, let me know. Understanding Manoj, Pranav, Shweta, everybody has any doubt? Understood? Yes. Okay. Pranav. Okay. Fine. 
now pragna i have a question for you uh, so pragna you let me know now just the exam uh, just a general question i am asking can i say it is very important to keep only good feature columns and bad uh, columns that are not worthy of becoming feature columns we need to remove correct it is important to keep only good feature columns okay columns that are not worthy to become a feature i should not have them in my feature column list okay so what i am trying to suggest with that is see over here when i applied count vectorizer on my tweets there could be words like is a so these are very common words so for these common words also a new column must have been created by count vectorizer and for these common words now over here they are treated as feature column now as i said for these common words a new feature column will be created right in count vectorizer do you think these common words help at all while uh, uh, doing the prediction common words like is a the do they suggest whether it is being treated by donald trump or justin trudeau do these common words help to predict whether it is treated by donald trump or justin trudeau ha huh. so pragna can i say i should remove these common words it won't help na so why to create a new column for it unnecessarily okay so what i can do is to count vector as i can say that if there are any common words in english language don't create a column for it okay your common words are also known as stop words so if at all you encounter those common words or stop words in english language don't create a column for it so there will be multiple common words in english language like is the a and so on okay so for those it will not create a new column and you will see previously we had 2500 columns being made now you will see less number of columns okay let me run the code from start previously you had 2500 columns being made now have a look pragya has the total number of columns reduced from 2500 you can see it has reduced so for those unnecessary words we didn't create a new column for those common words we didn't create a new column now let's see whether that affects our performance of the model or not let's see so previously the uh, performance of the model was what around 92% accuracy right 92.5% accuracy let's see if the performance increases okay previously the performance was 0.925 that means 92.5% accuracy let's see now if it increases does it increase pragya yes you can see it increases so removing bad feature columns also increases your performance of the model okay so remember that fine anyways uh all right so with this we have completed implementation of our uh second algorithm called multinomial name bias now i will just take uh, the doubt that saravanan had so i guess saravanan it was you right uh, who wanted to know about overfitting and underfitting problem in a machine learning model i guess it was you if it was somebody else well, let me know is that student there who asked it to me i don't remember is that student present still or not because because that student had asked it if you are mentioning something i have not received it yet in the chat who was the student is a uh, saravanan right saravanan is there okay fine so let me explain to you saravanan the problem of overfitting and underfitting overfitting underfitting and good fitting or perfect fitting and let me explain it to you with the help of a movie three idiots so let's say in three idiots we have three characters with us uh, the first character is that of chatur the second character is that of uh, rancho and the third character is that of farah okay fine uh uh or in fact let me mention uh, those three characters over here chatur rancho fara okay and now what i will do is generally what we do buddy is uh, saravan and remember this that uh, we calculate something called testing score that means score of data on the testing data set 
and in order to explain to you about overfitting and underfitting what we do is we in order to check whether a model is overfitting or underfitting we also calculate score on training data set so if you want to calculate score on training data set you also do that however it's just that training data set is something that the model has already trained on correct so it's like let's say you trained on a textbook and in the exam you get a question inside the textbook so can i say saravan and it will be very easy for you to answer that question that if you train on a textbook and you get the question inside of the textbook only then can i say it will be very easy for you to uh, answer it agreed saravan that you trained on a textbook and uh, you are asked a question inside the textbook then it will be very easy for you to answer and you will see generally what happens is the score on training data set is higher okay as you can see score on training data set is higher so this is like asking a question from it uh, asking a question from what it has already trained and obviously it has already trained on this data okay so if you ask it a question that it has already trained on it will answer well it will perform well on it okay but testing data it it, it has never seen okay so the, uh, generally what we do is we only test the model on testing data because testing data the model has never seen while training so it's new to it okay so it's like asking a question outside the textbook so in your exam if a question comes outside the textbook uh, that's good with that a person can judge you uh, whether you actually know the concept or not or whether you are just memorizing things okay because anybody can answer a question inside the textbook by just memorizing okay but to know whether you have actually understood the concept or not it is better to ask something outside the textbook by fine, fine anyways coming back to a question now i will need your help uh, so saravanan i will unmute your mic and i will need your help buddy uh to uh, explain this okay fine so saravanan what does testing score means uh, testing on new data or uh, data that it has already seen what does testing score mean i have unmuted your mic i have given you access for mic saravanan mic is not working okay now lakshmi uh, has a doubt with respect to accuracy yes lakshmi i'll come to that also although i explained it earlier uh, i will uh, explain that also is my voice reaching to you guys properly i don't know uh, maybe in between some part is getting cut i don't know whether my voice is reaching to you correctly or not okay that uh, okay but fine lakshmi if at all my voice didn't reach you due to some internet issue remember i will explain that to you again previously i also i explained how that accuracy increased once i am done with saravanan's doubt i will come back to your doubt okay fine anyways uh okay lakshmi meanwhile can you help me with this particular uh, uh concept over here so lakshmi i will try to unmute your mic if possible uh, can you help me with this particular concept i will ask some questions if possible try to answer it through mic okay lakshmi are you there i have given you mic access hello ha huh. okay lakshmi you are there right hi yes, sir yes so lakshmi now let's go ahead buddy and uh, now what i want to do is i want you uh, I, i want your help to understand this uh, concept over here called overfitting and underfitting let's understand now have you seen this movie called three idiots lakshmi have right, you seen sir. This? right yes. okay uh, if you ask chatur a question that that he has already learned let's say he was training on textbook so if you ask chatur a question that he has already trained on can i say he was performing very well yes sir he was performing very well right but if you ask chatur a question outside the textbook then th was he performing well no no he was not performing well so let's say if you ask a question outside the textbook uh, if you ask some questions outside the textbook he was only 80 per he was only getting accuracy of 80 uh, 60% let's say okay fine what about rancho if you ask rancho a question inside the textbook he was performing well any yes? variable is an ae no like there is no problem for him in writing right. in textbook correct there is no problem with him if you ask him anything inside the textbook or outside the textbook he was still performing well correct lakshmi what about farhan 
that uh, camera guy right who was interested in that uh, uh, camera uh, clicking pictures and all of that uh, what about him if you ask him a question inside the textbook was he performing well no right oh. if you remember his scores in in that movie he was not performing um, no. well no. right similarly if you ask him a question outside the textbook then also he was not performing well okay so this scenario guys where your training score is high but your testing score is low is called overfitting overfitting suggest that the model is trying to memorize the answers and it has not fully understood the patterns in the data okay so overfitting means training score is high but testing score is low whereas underfitting means both training score and testing score are low so lakshmi what does overfitting mean like overfitting means like we are providing excess amount of data to the model like it gets confused no no uh, the problem is not with data the problem is the model was memorizing the answers it That's didn't it. understand the uh, concept fully it didn't understand the data correctly right that's why if you ask it anything from the training data the model was performing very good but if you ask it anything from the testing data testing data is data that has never seen before during training if you ask it anything in from the testing data it was not performing well so this is called overfitting overfitting means training score is high but testing score is low underfitting means what both training score and testing score both are low okay whereas what do you want generally uh, if you are a ceo of a company lakshmi would you hire chatur rancho or faran rancho rancho because he is neither overfitting nor underfitting correct oh. right yes. he is rancho. perfectly fitting perfectly. on the data similarly have a look at our model buddy have a look at our training score what is our training score 99.678 correct Six, which is good right what is our testing score our testing score is also good it's good 0.9375 so here is any overfitting or underfitting happening at all no no okay fine so uh, saravanan uh, fine thanks for help lakshmi saravanan what does overfitting mean saravanan to you the question is what is overfitting what is overfitting sir on we just looked into it ha huh. so or can i say saravanan overfitting means training score is high but testing score is low correct training score is high but testing score is low agreed with me saravanan okay overfitting means that training score is high but testing score is low right okay what does underfitting mean saravan underfitting means that what does underfitting mean you correctly mentioned for overfitting that in overfitting training score is high but testing score is low what does underfitting mean no no saravan the problem is not that data is not enough what is overfitting uh, what does underfitting mean even if the data is not enough st uh, uh, still it's not necessary that always you will get underfitting only okay you have train you have seen our uh, model it's trained on very very less number of examples there still you did not get overfit uh, underfitting or overfitting okay uh, you will see that even if you have uh, let's say lacks of examples in your data lacks of rows in the data still the model suffers from underfitting okay so problem is not lack of data yes one of the reasons could be it's not necessary though okay but anyways keeping those reasons aside if you want to understand what is what it is first what is underfitting overfitting means training data is high testing data sorry uh, overfitting means training score is high testing score is low underfitting means both training score and testing score both are low saravanan says in that case we'll have to tune the model well saravanan even in overfitting we'll have to tune the model tuning the model means changing the model settings so even in overfitting you will have to tune even in underfitting you will have to tune okay but what is overfitting 
Overfitting means training score is high, testing score is low. Underfitting means both the score are low. Okay. Fine. However, it's very easy, or I should say comparatively, it's easy to improve a overfitting model. If at all a model is overfitting, it's easy to improve it. However, if a model is underfitting, sometimes even after a lot of efforts, you might not improve it. Okay. So comparatively, uh, it's easy to uh, work with an overfitting model. You can improve its performance. However, for an underfitting model, uh, sometimes it could get very difficult. Even after doing all the tries, you're doing all the efforts, you might still not improve the performance of an underfitting model. Okay. So just to uh, recap over here, I will need help of uh, Binesh. Is Binesh there? Binesh? Binesh is there? Okay, he might not be in front of his laptop. So let me put this question to everyone. Apart from Saravana, let me put it to everyone. What is overfitting? This problem was overfitting. What? When can I say that the model is overfitting? Uh, Binesh, when can I say that my model is overfitting, guys? When? When what happens? When can I say that my model is overfitting? Uh, so, Binesh says when the training score is high, but the testing score is low. Perfect, Binesh. Perfect, uh, perfect explanation. What does underfitting mean, Binesh? What does underfitting mean? What does underfitting mean? Even Lakshmi and uh, Smithanjay have given correct example, correct uh, explanation. What does underfitting mean? Binesh says underfitting means both training score and testing score both are low. Both training score and testing score are low. In that case, it will be called underfitting. Okay, fine. All right. Coming to one doubt that's, that Smithanjay has posted. Smithanjay says when will we get certificate? So. Uh, Remember, buddy, that for this training, you will get a badge. It's not a certificate as such, because certificate you will only get after you pass DP100 examination. But since you attended this training, you will get a badge from Microsoft. Badge is different, certificate is different. And in order to avail the badge, these steps are already mentioned by uh, Archie in the chat. I'll do one thing. I'll copy those steps again and give it to you in the chat again. Okay. I have given those steps to you again. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Smith and Jade, uh, in order to appear for examination, I will suggest you two things. First, go through all the theory that is mentioned in DP100 examination, how to go through that theory. So, this is the place to cover the theory. Okay. From here, you can go ahead and uh, learn about the theory. Okay. Uh, I'll give the link to you in the chat over here. For theory, this is the place to go to. For labs, uh, uh, let me show you the place for labs. So it's the correct place to work with labs. Okay. And here, if you open any of the labs, it will show you uh, uh, what to do. Okay. And so on. What steps to do. So this is the correct place through which you will get instructions for labs. Once you do both the things, once you do both the things, uh, Smith and Jai, then what you have to do is schedule the exam. Okay. Uh, so you can see over here in the first link that I shared with you, I have shared two links, one for theory, another for uh, practicing the labs and in that link for theory only uh, I think you should find a, a button for schedule exam yes if you scroll below you see a button for scheduling the exam you can click on the click on the button provide your details like name age and everything and uh, select the date in which you want to appear for examination remember there are two modes in which you can give the examination one is through uh, virtual mode where you can appear for the examination through your uh, home as well uh, another mode is you will have to go to uh, your nearest uh, exam center in which the exam will be conducted so you can appear in both uh, in any of these two modes okay 
and remember all the questions that will be asked will be mcq questions only you will get anywhere between 38 to 43 mcq questions the number of questions in the exam varies every day but anywhere you uh, anywhere between 38 to 43 mcq questions you will get in your examination a uh, total examination will be of 1000 marks out of which you need to score at least 700 to pass the examination okay fine any other doubt that you have guys any other doubt so guys uh, you understood what uh, whatever we covered today made sense understood was it understandable what we covered so we covered uh, machine learning basics first then we covered uh, two machine learning algorithms first was knn second was multinomial naive bias we saw the theory of those algorithms we also saw its practical implementation okay so were uh, uh, those demos that i showed to you the, those slides that i showed to you clear Okay, now uh, Lakshmi says, do we have any interactive labs? No, 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 no labs, only MCQs in the examination, no labs. Okay, uh, Smitan Jai, do you see an option for courses? Uh, uh, so I guess you are in the modules page. Next to modules, do you see an option for courses? Do you see it in your Microsoft portal? Yes, right. If you click on courses now, you will see this batch for DP100. Okay, which is called Azure Data Scientist. So you will see a batch for this. Okay. Uh, Lakshmi says, how did our accuracy of... Uh, huh, let's see. So Lakshmi, uh, let me ask you one thing. Can I say it's very important that while selecting features and target, fine, the target will select based on our use case, but while selecting features, we should only have those feature columns that help me to predict the target, right? Useless feature columns we should not keep. I mean, if a column is not worthy to become a feature, we should not have that column, correct? Yes or no? Lakshmi? Yes, okay. Now I have a question. Okay, let's suppose I have some tweets. Now, what will happen? Uh, in those tweets, we could have some common words. We could have some common words like is, a, the, so on. Now, do these common words help you to predict whether a tweet has been written by Trump or Justin Trudeau? Can I say these words can be written by anyone? Are these some special words? So, for example, let's say CNN is a special word. We know that, okay, CNN is uh, tweeted more by uh, Trump, not by Trudeau. Okay, so CNN is a good word that can help you to predict whether uh, uh, who is the author of the tweet. But these common words, Lakshmi, common words like is, a, the, do they help me to predict whether the author is Donald Trump or Justin Trudeau? No. No. So can I say for these common words, uh, in count vectorizer, we know for all the words, a new column is created. So hmm. can I say, Lakshmi, what I want is for these common words, new columns should not be created. Yes. New yes. feature yes. columns should not be created. Hmm. Correct. So yes. what yes. I did was, right, I made that setting in my code that for these common words, do not create a feature column. So now I don't have useless feature columns. Previously, I had them. Previously, for each of these common words like is, a, uh, they, uh, sorry, is uh, the for all of these common words, a, a new feature column was created. Okay, so we still had useless feature columns previously, but then I removed it. So with that, what happened if useless feature columns gets removed? It's like this, Lakshmi. If I'm training you and unnecessary, if I give you garbage information, then can I say your performance will be low, right? If I give you garbage information, your That's performance the in the exam will be low. No. Okay. On the other hand, if I remove that garbage information, if I only give you useful information, then your performance will be high. The same applies to the model. If you remove or if you remove those garbage feature columns that are of no use, the performance increases. Okay, Saravanan says, can you share the notebook? Yes, I'll share. Fine, so let me download it. Uh, 
I'll download it first. Let me download. And once it's downloaded, I will then upload it to you guys. Let me upload. Is there a way to upload the chat? Okay, I don't see a button to upload. Let me go to. As a document. Mm. Okay, I'll do one thing. I'll share it with Archie and Archie will make sure that uh, she sends the lecture materials to you guys. Okay, that will be better instead of sharing it over here. Okay, Saran, and I'll make sure that uh, on your emails, it's provided to you. Fine. Does that work? OK. Uh, fine. So that is it for today, guys. I hope you found today's lecture useful. OK, uh, the recording of this section uh, of this session will be available on our official YouTube channel. From there, you will get to uh, see more videos on DP 100. OK, uh, wherein we have covered other topics as well. You can go through it. Uh, Parak says, can you share some certificate paths for data science and data engineering? OK, so what you do is uh, let's say if I just starting off in data science, I would first suggest you to cover DP 900. Once that is done, then go to DP. Uh, uh, 100. Once that is done, go to DP 203. OK, once that is done, go to AI 900 certification exam. Once AI 900 is done, then go to AI 102. Once that is done, go to AI 050. So this is the path that I would suggest to you. You can take a screenshot of this if you like. Okay, what's this the path that you are expecting? Uh, so if I would, so if let's say you are going, uh, you want to know that in which uh, order should you do the certification, this is the order in which you should do. OK, first DP 900, then DP 100, then DP 203. Remember DP 203 is all about how you can do data engineering on Azure. DP 100 is to become a data scientist. DP 203 is to become a data engineer, basically. In other words. OK, wherein you will get to work, so, uh, work with services like Synapse, uh, and, uh, Data Factory, a lot of other services, Databricks, OK, the other services that you will work with. Fine. Uh, in fact, I missed one. Uh, there is one certification introduced right now. So which is DP 600. So after DP 203, cover DP 600 also. OK, uh, which is um, uh, fully made on a service called Microsoft Fabric. So this was just introduced some months back. This is a new certification and Microsoft Fabric is very important. Currently, there is a lot of demand for it in the market. So make sure that you do not skip DP 600 certification. Fine, so this is the order in which you should go ahead. Huh, as Lakshmi said, AI 900 is a basic one, but before you go to other AI certifications, make sure that you cover AI 900 first before you go to other AI certificates. Okay, make sure that you cover AI 900 first. As you mentioned, it's a basic one. Okay. Just like for DP 100, first I asked you to cover DP 900, right? DP 900 is a basic one. But before you go to any of the other DP certifications, I asked you to cover DP 900. OK, just like that. Fine, was this what you were uh, asking? Uh, sorry, who, what was the name? Parag, I guess. Or some other student. Yes, OK. Fine. 
so that is it for today guys i hope you found the lecture useful uh and uh, yeah do stay connected you can contact us on linkedin you can contact me on my personal linkedin id as well if you have any doubts or you can contact on the official uh, uh social media plat uh, social media channels that synergetics has okay so that is it for today uh, thank you for uh, attending yes thank you for uh, thank you pranav yes mitanjay you need doubt Any doubt? Any please mention. Is there any code for discount in test? I think Synergetics does provide. I think uh, you can contact us on email, and uh, uh, we. I think there is some uh, discount codes that we do provide. Although you can get more information about it from Archie, so you can contact her on email, and uh, she will mention what are these steps to avoid it. Okay, yes, we do provide discount codes, but I guess Archie will be the best person to guide you in that case. Okay, as Archie has mentioned uh, her email ID and uh, WhatsApp number, so you can contact over there. Okay. Yes, uh, welcome, uh, Dipti, Santa, welcome, Pragna. Okay, personal LinkedIn ID. Uh, you can just search for Smitsha Synergetics and I will come up. Smith Shah Synergetics. Okay. And uh, this is my link, the first one that will appear Smith Shah Synergetics. Okay. And you can connect with me over there if you want to. You got it. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. So that's it for today, guys. Thank you for attending, and we'll meet again in some other webinar. Bye, guys. Have a great day. Bye. Guys, make sure before leaving the session, you fill this feedback form. I already shared on chat box.